Good morning, everyone. We're going to wait just a minute more to make sure everyone uh, gets here before we, we get going. Hi, Martin. Hey, I just needed to go and refill on coffee here. <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> Actually, let, let me just this beautiful background a little bit. Allison, Jeremy, can you hear me? Yep. yep. Um, OK, I think we're all here. Um, so we're going to uh, get started. I wanted to thank you all for making the time for this. I know uh, there's a lot of there's been a lot of Zoom lately, and so I hate to add to the load, but I really appreciate um, you making the time. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm, Cis I'm Cisco, and uh, let me I'm going to do a sort of a five, I think I have 12 slides. I'm going to do a very brief introduction. Um, but I think all of my students are here now, or almost all of them. Uh, so let me introduce uh, uh, all of you first um, to the students so that they know uh, who they're hearing from. Uh, so uh, uh, oh, I'm gonna go in the order of my list. Uh, uh, Jeremy Fika, uh, whose review I was just on a few days ago, uh, is a, a, a professor at Carnegie Mellon. He directs their design fab lab and is the chair of their advanced uh, architectural design program. Uh, I know him, uh, I've known him for a long time, and he's a great critic and a, and a very good designer. So thank you, Jeremy, for making the time for this. Um, Allison Wilson. Uh, Allison, I don't know you, uh, but I, I know that you're uh, with Ayer St. Gross, a senior associate, and uh, uh, the sustainability director there. So we're looking forward to uh, your, your perspective on this work. Um, and then Martin Hadish, who's a colleague here at the school. Um, the students know Martin as the the instructor giving the better version of this integrative studio. Uh, uh, so I'm looking forward to, to both seeing his work tomorrow, his students' work, but also you know, having his input. Um, we, uh, this, this studio is a, it's, it's an advanced studio, but it's the integrative studio, which is the one that serves sort of many of the accreditation criteria of, you know, the students are expected to take an idea uh, through a design into a, a, a more detailed level of development, beginning to look at assemblies and materials in a little more uh, serious manner than, than you have time to get to often in a, in a regular studio. So that's on the, the agenda here, uh, in addition to the, the design, uh, the design uh, foundations. Uh, and we have the luxury, the students, these are all the graduate students, They're, they work in pairs generally, we have an odd number, so we have one, sing, one single te person team. Uh, and um, uh, and because they work in pairs, we don't have that many projects today. We have the luxury of, of having a little bit more time than we normally would in a final review. I've asked them, uh, everyone here once more, to not spend too much time talking. So there'll be plenty of time for uh, all of us to talk uh, about their projects. But I'm going to try and say uh, almost nothing after the introduction. So let me pull up. Uh, oh, I still have my screen share. Uh, let me pull up a little bit of, uh, uh, let me pull up my slide deck. And um, I'll just walk you through the project quickly. Okay, can you all see that? Yeah, okay. So, uh, yeah, so the, the studio is called Boundary Effects, and, and the general, uh, the, the theme or the issue which, which the project was centered on is this idea of, e of edge conditions or boundaries. Um, and the, uh, uh, we've tried to look at those edge conditions in uh, several different ways, but uh, the underlying premise is that a boundary, even a virtual one, like a political, you know, a, a property line or a, uh, you know, a boundary line between two countries, 
is never is never non-dimensional, right? It always generates a territory or a, a, a set of activities around it, um, and that. Uh, so when you think about boundaries as territories um, or a zone of space, it's inherently spatial, and it's one of the things that architecture is really well suited to do, right? It's essentially to condition the relationships between uh, physical spaces. And so we tried to look at those both uh, kind of external site circumstances and also internal conditions within the building. Uh, so the project is set up um, to try and foreground those conditions, obviously. Um, so I'll describe the site first and a little bit about the program, and then I'll talk just so a bit about the process and turn it over to the first, uh, the first project. Uh, so the site is an odd one. It's, uh, it's um, in a town called Morgan's Point, uh, which is along the Houston Shipping Channel. So on this, this map, the, uh, the Gulf of Mexico and Galveston uh, Bay is down and to the right, and Houston uh, is uh, to the left-hand side. And so the Houston Shipping Channel uh, is a, uh, has over you know, many decades has progressively been deepened and widened, and the status of the ground in this area is very, very um, changing um, uh, because uh, you know, a lot of the spoil that they've generated when they continually dredge this channel has led to a lot of new land masses. Uh, um, so the site itself is on this peninsula, which was a historic town, um, uh, but it, on the north side of that peninsula, there is a uh, container port. You know, containerized shipping really was developed in the 60s and has grown, as I'm sure you all know, tremendously over the last decades. And so the, the economic pressures on that port to expand have been tremendous, and it has, in fact, expanded a lot, which has led to a very uh, unusual condition. So this is an aerial photo. To the right is the Houston Shipping Channel, and this is called Barber's Cut. This, uh, this Basically, it's a place for the container ships to pull up to the uh, edge of the land and a turning basin at the far end. And this entire area now is essentially a big, giant, flat piece of concrete. Um, and as the uh, economic pressures for the Port of Houston, the Port of Houston has a number of facilities. This is just one of them. Uh, but as they've, uh, they have a tremendous amount of economic and political power, and have, as they've gotten more, uh, more traffic, they've just expanded this port uh, more and more. And so the site itself is this little, it's about a 300 foot square a cemetery that used to be kind of on the top of a very gentle hill within this community. And it's just been completely engulfed by the port. And the port would have taken it over if it could, but because of sort of the cultural gravitas of cemeteries, uh, it couldn't. And so we, they've ended up with this scenario, this very surreal scenario, this very traditional cemetery completely in, encircled by industry. You know, the port runs 24 seven. It has all sorts of tall and loud equipment. It has lights on, you know, at night. It's never really dark in the cemetery. Um, but the southern side of the peninsula is still really um, pretty intact. It's, uh, it has some very large houses along the water, which uh, some of which were owned by sort of the titans of industry, shipping and oil the drilling. Uh, but most of the houses are quite modest, and uh, it has a little bit of a main street to the, to the west there as well. As you might imagine, the land side operations of the port are also pretty intense. So these, these are railroad sidings here. And this, this primary boulevard is, is essentially a truck highway. Uh, the trucks come in with containers and leave with containers. Um, and they actually move through the port sort of along this line. Um, there are a few buildings in the port. The, the operations, the sort of the internal program of the port is pretty, is pretty uh, atomized into a series of lots of little buildings. So that's the general situation. Here you see a, at the bottom a picture of the port and the, the land to the north side of Barber's Cut, which again is almost all fill. Um, originally, this really didn't exist as a substantive land mass. And at the top is one of the most grand, is the largest house along that waterfront uh, uh, on the south side of that peninsula. Um, so here you see the, the sort of truck boulevard and the cemetery itself. Um, to the right, this used to be, if you see, can you see my arrow? Yeah, this used to be the entrance to the cemetery, and now it's here and there's a little parking lot. And uh, because the cemetery used to be kind of along the top of a very gentle hill, uh, when the concrete plinth of the 
a port encroached, there's about a five or six foot elevation difference. The cemetery is about six feet higher than the rest of the port. And there's sort of a no man's land between the cemetery itself and the port surface, which is actually the site of the program. You know, the port needs all of its surface area for containers and trucks and whatnot. The cemetery needs its, its land for, you know, for dead people. Um, but this little fringe, this edge condition between these two very, very different kind of environments is essentially the site of the project. And you'll see um, different, different teams have taken different approaches. Some have tried to build the whole thing. Some have picked, uh, you know, concentrated their program in one area. Uh, but they kind of had to be on that scene between the two environments. So um, this is just an image. This, this, this top view is a panorama. It makes it the cemetery seem bigger than it really feels when you're there. But uh, there's this condition. These are these these are the newer cranes, the post Panamax size cranes, and they're just huge. You can sort of see a switchback stair, you know, climbing up the very top of this crane, and they move back and forth. You know, they're on they're on wheels, so they move back and forth along the edge. So you're in this sort of um, semi natural environment uh, with lights and beeping noises of things backing up and things moving above the horizon around you uh, on different sides in different ways. Um, just a few other sort of contextual images here. I'm standing on the left. I'm standing at the just before the entrance to the cemetery, looking back at the parking lot, and you can kind of get a sense of that five to six foot elevation change. And to the right is an image of the inside the cemetery itself. It's a uh, although it's higher because it has uneven terrain. It, it does have some drainage problems, and some students have addressed that as part of their project idea. Well, I included this image just because the students built it and then they didn't get to use it, but they made a site model <laughs> of, the, of a kind of transect through the, the cut all the way back through to the, the beginnings of the, the town here. Um, but uh, that got finished just about the time that we kicked them all out of school. And, and so I don't think you're going to see a whole lot of this model. I felt obliged to put it in just to show you that it was there. So that's the site. Again, a very unusual site, but uh, you know, it was picked intentionally to kind of foreground this issue of edge and what you're going to do with the edge and how your building is going to try and shape kind of the experiences within the edge and adjacent to the edge. And the program is the same way. It's a multi-use program. Um, and there's really three different user groups and three different uses in the program. And the reason for that is, uh, you know, I, I thought it'd be helpful to have internal boundaries between different user groups or different uses within the building itself. because That's another kind of boundary that architecture, the architecture could begin to engage. So for visitors to the cemetery, there is essentially a, a meeting hall or a chapel, along with a few support functions, like a few offices and a, and a garage so they have a place to put them over and things like that. Um, for the port stevedores, which are the, the folks who are working in the yard of the port, um, there is uh, some program, some administrative program, but also some facilities for, for those folks who need a place to you know, go to the bathroom and eat lunch and get out of the sun and that sort of thing. And then the last piece is a, uh, is a hotel. So this image at the top is a gas station just, just to the uh, west end of this peninsula that has a, uh, I think it was 22 room hotel for truckers on the second floor. And we bribed our way in to get a tour and I was expecting to be this, this crazy sort of situation. And uh, it turned out to be a super normal looking hotel. So that was a little disappointing, but, uh, but the truckers, you know, are, who are often coming from far away uh, they, they drop off their containers or uh, pick them up, but um, when they stay overnight, uh, they can't, they're never within the port unless they're dropping or picking up. So there's this need for uh, overnight accommodations. And uh, typically when the truckers are staying here, they are, uh, they don't have a, a container. They're just the tractor, not the tractor trailer combo. Uh, but one of the things we found out as we did um, the research for the, at the beginning of the semester, is the crews for the ships also need, need a place to stay. One of the interesting things that's happened with containerization is that uh, it used to be, you know, ships when they docked took forever to unload because uh, it was all loose cargo. Um, now, typically, even the large ships are unloaded in 18 to 20, the typical turnaround time is 18 to 24 hours. And so the ship crews don't really have time to get out and get into town like they used to. And in fact, within the port, there is a uh, sort of hotel facility just for the, the ship crews. And so the students were free to decide whether 
their hotel was for truckers who were really coming from the outside of the port or for ship crews who are kind of within the port security and never leave or some combination of the two. Um, so those were the three programs. Um, we went through a programming exercise, which, you, um, which kind of reflects those three programs, but the meeting hall chapel program, the lodging chapel or the lodging program and the port services program. And there was quite a bit of uh, latitude. So we had a net of between 11,000 and 30,000 square feet. And when you add for circulation and services, we were looking at a, a gross square footage of somewhere between 22,000 and 50,000 square feet. So not a, not a small building, but not tremendously huge either. And finally, uh, a little bit a little bit about the process. Um, these are not from this semester, but I had them to two exercises at the very beginning after doing the research. Um, and the first one was called ligature transect, where they were asked before designing a building to actually take a stab at a cross a ligature. For those of you who follow the news, you know Elon Musk's um, new baby has a ligature in its name. It's it's when you take two um, letters and combine them together. Uh, but the idea was to take just a slice of the building across this uh, across this um, edge between port and cemetery and, and ideally uh, between two programs as well and just design a little sort of like a sample of the building uh, in order to begin to think about what it might be made out of what kind of spatial you know vocabulary it might take on without having to do all the planning of and, and uh, kind of big scale down sort of thinking about the project, uh, which, which followed this exercise. So that was the first exercise. We call that ligature transect. And I think you'll see a number of these images as we go through the projects. Uh, the second project, or the second introductory exercise I uh, called affect constitution. And that was similarly an idea to think about uh, what uh, experience might be, a spatial experience or a, a sort of a condition of presence for the building might be. Uh, before really designing it, um, trying to get at kind of intentions about quality of space. Um, and that was paired. So these are two affect drawings. I did this exercise once before. These are two affect drawings from a previous studio. And that was paired with a constitution drawing, which was in, uh, which, in which the students were asked to think about like what the materials and constructive kind of qualities might be of the project. So they did those first, um, again, an effort to get at some intentions directly and not back into some of those decisions um, late in the process. And then they were essentially free to pursue the project design. Um, so with that, then I'm gonna stop and uh, I'm gonna turn it over to, uh, I, do, I should ask if there's questions or anything I can clarify before we jump into the projects. Okay. Just that uh, one, um, how long is the entire semester? To work on this or they worked on this essentially the whole semester you know okay. we did a research phase which was um i don't know maybe two weeks and then each of those introductory things were a week each mm -hmm. um, and then we built a site model so probably at about five or weeks in they were they were really working okay. on the project design so it's been a full semester thank you yep okay uh Ariella, uh, so our, our non-paired person is up first. Uh, Ariella, do you, you want to share screen and start your presentation? Yes. Um, hi. Oh, wait, Ariella, before you start, I need to just warn everyone. I think all of you know, but um, we are live streaming all of our reviews. I just feel like I need to tell you that um, uh, because I would do things I might not uh, do otherwise if I knew I was being live streamed. Okay. Go ahead, Ariel. Sure. Um, let me. Oh, I'm not even at the beginning page. Excuse me. One second. <sighs> Sorry, my computer decided to be slow all of a minute. Ah, there we go. Nope. Um, hi, my name is Arielle Yendler. I did Integrative Alone this semester. Uh, this is my last studio and I will be graduating afterwards. My, can you hear me all right, by the way? Yeah, 
Awesome. Uh, I have a background in architectural history. Um, and so this is my first architectural school, I suppose. Anyway, so my project, um, it's called, I titled it Tree Houses for the Flood. And that's because the immediate sensation I had about the cemetery and about our site was that of an island for a few reasons. Firstly, because it is the only raised ground left in a completely flat condition. It's the only natural ground uh, left and it's completely surrounded by asphalt. But then also when we started learning about the site, um, looking at the flood maps, it was really clear that in the next couple of hundred years with climate change on the rise and climate change accelerating that we could expect to see floodwaters rising and reaching that area much more quickly. As far as the Port of Houston goes, it's unclear how long the Barber's Cut Terminal will be able to function as a port, if that's even possible in 100, 200, 300 years. And I wanted to think about how you design for a place that has a very kind of uh, fluctuating area, taking inspiration from the port of from you know Houston and uh, Galveston Bay around me, I looked at how locally they dealt with the conditions of building uh, right at a waterline. And what I saw over and over were people putting their houses on stilts, um, you know, raising their houses up. And when you look offshore, you also see the remains, as you can see down here, of um, piers and docks. And so that's what has locally been, and also I think worldwide, been the solution to deal with a place where the ground condition is unstable, it's very waterlogged, and you're expecting a lot of change in the water, it was just to raise it and put it on docks. And I thought that that was also an appropriate boundary condition to try to create around this island, around this island cemetery, something that could both um, something that could act as uh, a approachable border to survey where you're from. So a lot of my early design process work ended up being about how to build vertically and how to build things on stilts. I looked at things like um, Terunobu Fujimori, who builds Japanese tea houses on stilts. And as you can see in my affect constitution model, you know, how to handle uh, stacking or vertical building. And I realized over and over that it was so that the arrangement was fluctuating so much because what mattered wasn't actually how the space was arranged but what it was sitting on it was the structure and the exoskeleton and so eventually i real uh, eventually that meant that the project that i designed was about not what the building infill would be but what would be left behind in the end and when you look out um, off, when you look out offshore, you see the remains of the piers and the docks, and you just see the piles left. And I was thinking, what if instead that could be a usable condition? That could be something that was intentional rather than just an unusable remain. And so the building that I designed ended up being something with uh, a permanent, a permanent pile structure piles or piers or um, the various names that they have are usually uh, done, they're usually just the foundation. And instead here, I decided to extend them all the way up through the building. So they function both as the foundation condition and as um, a structural element and exoskeleton for you to build in. And so a lot of the design was about how to create that. So the, as you can see, the perspective for now is the building as it would look now. Uh, it's functional for the port, for lodging. There's another portion across the way that's for the chapel, which I'll get to. But then in 100 years, in 200 years, that infill will disappear. And what's left is this, these um, 200 foot deep concrete friction piles with steel embed plates that are there in order to facilitate building for whatever the needs might be. That might not be a port eventually. That might be something else, but the structure that remains can be used for that. And so here's, this is a diagram that you can see just a little more clearly that all of the infill structure is meant to 
be changed out easily. Um, in order to do that, I did the, so there's the concrete timber piles, uh, which you can see here, no, not timber piles, excuse me, the concrete friction piles. And then all of the structure is um, steel with wood and kind of uh, wood uh, flooring and walls. It's meant to be very much an assembly condition that you can assemble and disassemble easily. The structure is exposed on the interior. There's no hiding what any place is. It's very clear that this is something that's been put together in order that you can see how it can be taken apart, except for the concrete piles. Um, so one of the details that that building also necessitated was in order to help build for the future, I think I mentioned earlier, was that the precast um, concrete piles also have uh, steel embed plates put into them in order to facilitate future connection points. So there are embed plates up and down the entirety of the concrete piles, which are 70 feet high um, above ground level. And so <clears throat> even though on some of them, you've got these uh, girders that support the existing structure, if there's the decision to change that structure moving forward, it's facilitated already by what has been left. Um, that building, the condition of the concrete piles is on the north edge of the cemetery site. And on the south edge is the chapel. Part of my reason to separate the two is because of what I saw the chapel as, which is less of this permanent installation that could be reused moving forward, but instead is something that will be eventually swept away. The chapel is much less, um, the chapel is much more traditional. It's built on a dock structure as well. And that's over here. You guys can see my cursor, right? Okay, great. Um, it's built over here. And so that's a much more traditional timber dock structure um, with timber piles that aren't set very deep. And part of the reason that I made the chapel as a in chapel intentionally meant to be swept away was because the cemetery already experiences flooding in something like 50 to 100 years when floodwaters are constant and the land around it begins and the land of the cemetery begins to degrade, the cemetery won't be functional anymore. Morgan's Point is already um, incredibly like small in population. That's gonna continue. And so I didn't see any reason for the chapel to be part of the future of the building. It is instead what ends up washing away, you'll get those posts um, that are the remainder that you see all around Galveston Bay and you see what's left. As opposed to across the way on the cemetery, you see a possibility of something that can support the future. Uh, access to the site is also divided up. So uh, the chapel here functions as a gateway. Um, and in order to uh, kind of enhance that, land, that island condition, it also meant that the chapel uh, in order to access the chapel in the cemetery, I created a raised land bridge of a sort um, where you start at the grade level of the port and you go up through in order to access the chapel on, on this land bridge. Conversely, the, um, the lodging and the port administration is separated out completely. So lodging is approached by the truckers uh, over here on a separate road and they are at grade of the port, they enter um, and park along the cemetery. So they're essentially existing in the ocean condition of the land surrounding the cemetery. The port uh, administration would be over here. And so port and um, lodging are next to each other and combined because they don't really have anything to do with the cemetery itself. They're about what they're looking out on, which is the port. Um, so just um, a little bit more about the chapel, which is, as you can see, the gatehouse condition is also meant to be a filtration. Um, so the structure of the, of the kind of traditional dock structure of the piles down there has also been uh, brought up and is through and goes through the entire site. There's an enclosed unconditioned space for the gathering hall area where people can uh, have services, but essentially the the space is meant to be just a pass-through filter in order that you can access the rest of the cemetery. 
And so this is just a view of the chapel from the south as you're approaching, uh, as you're approaching on the on the road. Um, so perspectively, the chapel, um, the, the columns again are uh, turned and have the diagonal condition just to slow down, you know, and make clear that threshold condition. When you enter the cemetery, however, um, Excuse me. Oh, ah, uh, oh, there we go. Sorry, I skipped ahead a little too far. Um, when you enter the cemetery, one of the main points is that uh, you see the cemetery, but then you also see uh, the building for the port administration on the other side. And uh, I wanted to have a softer edge from the cemetery perspective. So in order to deal with the existing condition of the trees, instead of just a normal straightforward um, grid, I adjusted and shifted the pile arrangements um, to give, um, to A, preserve the trees and also give a more scattered kind of natural soft boundary. And that means that when you're standing in the cemetery at night, what you also see are these um, glowing lanterns scattered in amongst, oops, these glowing lanterns scattered in amongst the trees and in, uh, in and amongst the piles. Those are the service and circulation cores for the building, but they also are meant to be, you know, a, a more poetic element that speaks to the cemetery users and kind of helps them, because as you can see, the gantry cranes in the back are massive. And so it helps them step up to that level visually. Organization-wise, the, uh, the port side building or north side building, um, on you've got on the bottom floors um, are the more public uses and then as you go up through the building it gets more and more uh, private so to speak uh, so the bottom floor um, has the bodega over here there's the entrance for the um, for the truckers uh, through the back uh, as you go through that kind of you just skirt through the boundary condition of the forest um, but if you are coming from the ship, I wanted you also to be able to access that so you can access by ramp or by stair coming from the port side. Uh, the rest of the port administration on the bottom is, well, there's, um, there's the locker room, break room, and just uh, admin, and that's all meant to be very easily accessible. So you can come in at any point um, up to, like you raise up to the dock, the dock building. Uh, and in order to access the rest of the building, um, the access is separated out by those circulation cores. So security wise, that makes it very easy to control who can and can't access what parts. In order to get up to the hotel room, you have to go in through the elevator or the stairs, which are then only accessible by that one entrance. Um, moving up through the building. So on the third floor, uh, on the third floor, uh, whereas the second floor for the lodging is all, um, the second floor for the lodging is all the social spaces as you go up, like I said, it gets more private. So you've got communal sleeping and that was to offer a variety of price points for the people who are going to use the lodging. Um, you, they might want more private room in which case they can go up all the way to the top or they might want a more public communal sleeping um, if they're you know tired of being a solitary on the road. And then on the, and then on the administration side, you've got your general workspace. And then as you go higher up, you've got a conference room. And at the top, you've got just um, a viewing platform up at the roof that help, that is just where you can go to experience a private exterior moment. This is a section through the port administration side of the building. Um, and you can see that it's, that there's a, a vertical layering that happens. And that's because all of the building was, or all of the building, once the pile structure was set, the program was all arranged to reflect to, to itself internally and arranged around the circulation cores. So this is the break room with an interior mezzanine. And in order to access the other spaces shown, you exit onto this exterior, um, onto this exterior circulation space here, which I will show in a a little bit of a moment. Um, and this is the section through the uh, lodging area. So as, so you know, it's, it's a little more open and um, exterior oriented 
to the port side lower down in order to get this vertical relationship. And then as you go higher up, it becomes much more self-contained. Um, all of the exterior space, and by exterior, I mean just all the circulation space around the building is industrial grade, is industrial um, steel grading and mesh, and that exposes the structure. It's very lightweight. It, it you know, creates a very open feeling without um, actually being inside. So you move from building to building or room to room in the program area that you need through this exterior circulation space. So you get to have the experience of um, passing through an area without being disconnected from it while providing a shielding from the cemetery. Um, and then this would be the interior space inside um, one of the port administration rooms, where as you can see, the circulation cores oftentimes break directly into uh, the rooms. And that's A for access and B also because it has an intersecting quality that ties you to the exterior and ties the building together structurally as a, a, an amalgamation, a mishmash of all of these various elements that do what they need to do. Um, in order to support who is there. What that looks like in the end, I think is very much what I originally tried to, what I wanted originally, which was um, kind of a vertical amalgamation that perhaps seemed a little haphazard, but had a very consistent internal logic. Um, and so the building, while it looks a little bit, uh, a little bit of a, Kind of mishmash, it serves itself. And furthermore, you can see very clearly, I think that the piles are what serve those who use it. And uh, that the piles are the permanent strongest feature of the project. Thank you, Ariana. Thank you. That's the end, Ariel. <laughs> Sorry, that was the end. Yeah. I had just a couple of questions to help me understand some more of your decision making. Uh, and, and let me start by saying um, I, I don't think you should apologize for the, the facade fenestration for the uh, massing aggregation within your piles. You, you called it a mishmash, and, and I think you, you do yourself a little bit of a disservice in the sense that I think it's more interesting uh, and nicer than a mishmash. So um, uh, I think that overall the aggregation and the kind of distribution of rooms within the piles um, uh, is intriguing. I, I would be interested in knowing a little bit more about your decisions for the height of the piles, if I could read the drawing correctly, it looked like they were maybe around 70 feet uh, above sea level. Um, mm -hmm. And it would be interested to know where that number comes from and, and what was maybe driving some of your decisions about how tall to go, as well as perhaps driving some of your decisions about uh, how dense or loose to fill the piles. Um, yes, so the density of filling the piles, I can, by the way, go back to the section so you can see uh, the, you can see the numbers there. Um, yes, and the height is 70. Um, the piles, uh, the density is just, was determined by the program itself. The, I knew that I wanted the entire north edge to be a protected condition to serve, to serve as a barrier um, so that the building needed to stretch along the entirety of it. As far as the height of the piles, it was in it was it ended up shaking out that way partially because of how much program I wanted to put together and how much I didn't. Uh, and I was very much in favor of a building that or of a building that kind of scattered itself around. So I wanted enough space um, to be I wanted enough space for open spaces to be a possibility like that there were balconies, just random exterior balconies you could go stand on uh, or interface with as a courtyard, like a, a false courtyard almost before you went to a different part of the building. Uh, in, addition to, um, in addition to just wanting everything to be vertically stacked and contained within this single edge. The reason why I ask is one thing which I find striking about your scheme 
is the ability for people to get up into a pretty commanding elevation above the trees. Mm -hmm. Having never been to the site, but from the initial photos that Cisco showed, um, it was remarkable to see the, the kind of stark difference between being in the cemetery, uh, which was kind of ringed by trees and then these cranes kind of looming above. Um, and I can imagine for folks that are perhaps the truckers, I wonder if much of their kind of day-to-day -day experience of the site is, is horizontal, right? It's kind of mitigated through just the act of being in a truck and kind of driving across the site. Uh, and one of the things that your project potentially starts to allow for is the ability for an individual to understand and read the landscape with a more commanding view, almost akin to being in the crane or being on the bridge of a ship in a way. Um, and I, I found it really quite nice, the ability to uh, move someone vertically up through the landscape. I, I kind of wish that perhaps there was more of an understanding of what, what that gives us um, and, and how much of a kind of prospect we are getting out across the landscape. But um, I, I'm intrigued by the uh, kind of aggregate quality of the room containers, if you may, that are nested within the piles. Um, and I personally appreciate the fact that it's not a tight fit. Um, and I'm still trying to understand exactly what some of the affordances are of maybe being in between these kind of breezeway spaces programmatically or experientially. But in principle, um, I think that the decision to move vertically um, gives many uh, kind of benefits, both from an experiential standpoint, but also, as you mentioned early on in your presentation, um, looking down a longer time scale, uh, I think that the decision to um, map out possible future scenarios in which the kind of lighter framing or construction logic of the rooms goes away, but the piles remain. Uh, I do kind of wonder if we're to imagine the site basically being all flooded, how might we understand what something like this as a site might become? Um, is it a place that we only engage and use through boats? Uh, could this basically land is swept away? Um, but, but I applaud uh, the attempt to approach the design through longer time scale um, and to uh, inject a, a kind of um, temporariness, if you may, to the way that you're understanding the tectonic logic of the building. Thank you. Um, it's actually very interesting that you brought up the vertical prospect point because I didn't include it in the set, um, but the original affect constitution drawing I did was about platforms um, of looking down around, uh, looking around the landscape. I was very much, like you said, the cranes really caught my imagination and I originally was very much thinking about uh, kind of the Studio Ghibli style of a small figure looking upon something massive you know, the way that you want to go up towards them. That didn't end up becoming part of the justification. I just moved away from that as far as the verticality justification. Um, but that was one of the original inspirations was the idea of uh, approaching the cranes and how to look at them when you are so small in a scale condition. I, I have um, two comments or, or question slash comment on, on very different scales, actually. The first one, I think, is a, is a very broad um, question about the sort of cultural significance of this idea of ruins. Because in, in some ways, you know, you're not the first one who is fascinated by the sort of like durability of remains of a building past the actual building's lifespan. And I, I think there's sort of like very different motivations for that, you know, in, in the sort of like, um, 18th and like early 19th century sort of like European kings built themselves little ruined gardens to sort of like feel connected to a kind of Western civilization, like namely sort of like Italy, Greece. Um, the Nazis um, tried to design their buildings to in some ways kind of like build a kind of like imagined legacy into the two meter thick walls and talked about the ruined value that those would have um, 
Johnson like had his Bank of England painted as a ruin in, in a kind of like similar way to establish the legacy. So I'm just curious what in your mind the legacy or what what, what anybody who and, and who would learn something from this and what they would learn in the future or like where you see the value of that. Uh, I think you're you're you hit the nail on the head as far as ruins go because yeah I've got my degrees and my original degrees in architectural history and so that's that's definitely been something always on my mind you're absolutely right um, it was also just thinking about climate change as far as what do the ruins look like of our modern buildings um, and you know most of the apocalyptica movies that have significant architecture movies like Mad Max and things like that. You see our original buildings just kind of, our, our buildings aren't made for long-term value. They're not made to be used in the future. And so I wanted to create something that looked very evocative, like it looked very clearly like it supported something, but also like it had the structural integrity to support something moving forward. As far as what lessons um, we could like, uh, somebody from the future could learn from that, I'm not really, I don't know that I actually approached that thinking as intentionally as I should have. Um, but I definitely did want something that looked a little more structurally sound uh, when it was all gone or when the components that we would use were gone, what was left looked like it could support something moving forward. And then I think I think maybe maybe it's it's almost a follow up question, which which actually sort of goes into the, the sort of like um, tectonics of your project, um, because like I mean I mean I'm, I'm observing that there is there's really sort of like a well it's not really a double negative, but but there are two decisions that that in some ways in in my mind almost sort of cancel each other out, which is the decision to um, to design the piles in ways that are not kind of rigorous and aligned and gridded. And then on top of that, you have an infill that is equally not aligned and gridded. Mm -hmm. And, and so I, th I think in some ways, the image of the building in its, let's, let's call it the original state, the kind of like occupied state is, is very similar to the image of the abandoned project mm -hmm. down the road. So, so and, and I wonder like, if that was ever a discussion that you had or what made you decide that because I, I could imagine like a variety of, of scenarios right like I could imagine sort of like the build the, the project in its occupied state being kind of wild and sort of like full of different threshold conditions but then when everything is stripped away like what's left is this completely rigorous and kind of industrial sort mm -hmm. of gridded um, remains structure of remains or for that matter, the other way around, right? Like there's there's something where the building actually kind of the structure sets up a sort of rich spatial experience, but from the outside, it's just like shiny and kind of seemingly um, very straightforward um, and, and, and gridded or rigorous. And then when it is stripped away, what's actually revealed is the kind of core of things, which, which I think is, is sometimes kind of the interesting thing, thing about like ruins or seeing sort of like projects, buildings in, in a derelict state, because we actually sort of get a, it, it, they sometimes reveal things about a project or a building that we didn't know before. And like, I, I feel like it's a little bit like, I'm, I'm not feeling I'm really learning that much that I don't know about your project yet when I look at it in the occupied state. Mm -hmm. I think you're right. No, it's, 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 mm very uh, on the nose that you point that out because Vince Snyder also during development review pointed out the fact that, you know, the, the uh, a re rearrangement of the piles didn't necessarily uh, facilitate that future condition like I wanted it to as like cleanly. Um, and I think you're right that it, it was a discussion. Um, I did start with that kind of very rigorous, let me see if I can find it, but that very rigorous grid of piles. Um, and I eventually ended up shifting them because I wanted I wanted a softer boundary. It felt very much like a rigor, a far more rigorous boundary. And I also wanted something that even if it wasn't built on moving forward, uh, could like could function visually as a more organic, well, not organic, but as a more um, kind of haphazard ruined state. I, I think it also provided a more rich sectional condition, which was also part of the goal. Um, I think you're right that I absolutely could have, I could have been a little more rigorous in one, in either infill or in structure and um, then gone completely the opposite way. 
But like I said, originally um, with the process work, I was also very much interested in that kind of haphazard vertical fishing village idea. And I went very far in that direction. Well, so in the drawing that you have in front of you, uh, the line of piles towards the top of the drawing near your text. Yeah. Is that a boundary condition that you cannot go past? So why you've elected to shift the piles in response to the trees, why mm -hmm. can't array of piles move up away from the trees? Is there a hard limit for your site beyond which you can't construct? Um, no, there wasn't. I mean, Cisco advised us to keep it pretty narrow. Um, sorry, Cisco, I don't mean to push it on you. Uh, but Cisco advised us, advised us to keep it pretty narrow because we were trying to explore boundary conditions. So I wanted to keep it within that very kind of narrow framework. I also thought it was going to be a more, it was a more dock-like experience. Um, in addition, where the piles are situated, like that back line, um, or the top line rather, I wanted to make sure that enough of the building engaged with the level of the cemetery that it sat on there. Um, so it felt like it was coming off of the cemetery land, like it was going to be a pure condition off onto there. There, there is one, th one, one thing which I find um, a, a little bit peculiar, um, which is, it's kind of ironic, maybe back to the comment about the, the kind of the rune as the legacy of the initial instance of the building. And in a way, it's kind of odd that given the massive infrastructure of the port, mm -hmm. the remnant that you elect to represent in that 100 year out image of the piles is of comparatively the piece of infrastructure programmatically and in volume wise is, is quite small compared to like even one of these massive cranes. Um, and there's for me kind of culturally something a little bit amiss maybe about that, of if there is the possibility of this thing telling some story, having within it some embedded history, um, uh, might there be other kind of reference to the poor um, I don't have a clear answer for that at the moment, but there, and the other comment that I would make uh, is that there's also to me, I think perhaps a missed opportunity by placing the chapel completely apart from the, the pile um, system. I, I kind of wish that perhaps you folded more of that complexity programmatically into the system um, and used um, the section as a way to kind of explore the possible friction between these distinct uses. Allison, I think, I think you. Yeah, I think for um, a number of these comments as well, like I appreciate the idea of what happens after, because um, very frequently we are all building and designing things right now that are not thoughtful enough about that perspective. Um, but I, I do think um, if you had tested some other programs in here for what it could be, right, of like, if it is a site that in a later date is going to be accessed by both, like, how does that work? And maybe, you know, in response to this particular column grid, like this had a particular shift related to existing landscape. Makes sense, works for me. Then it, what is the, like, is there another evolution that as you start testing other programs in this, the structural frame wants to respond in a different kind of way to be better able to absorb that? Um, because obviously, you know, with kind of a, a residential scale room, you have a very specific meter to that, um, which starts to set up a very particular logic. Um, but would there be different logics to other kinds of programs fitting into this kind of grid? I think the other piece, um, I have to applaud the, the embodied carbon aspect of this um, and kind of that idea of deconstruction uh, that gets great mm -hmm. success for me. Uh, but I have real questions about the operational carbon piece, and I think that could actually help you with your relic aspect yeah. as well. I see your your beautiful little uh, circle ducks um, kind of with their cross through, and I've got big questions about how you're servicing all these little pods, because uh, that's a whole lot of envelope in a really unforgiving climate. Yes. Um, so I think in the set um, that in the set that you received, like you can see that um the mechanic that these are meant to be the mechanical cores mm -hmm. um it is a lot of envelope um as far as i'm like all 
are you asking like how the mechanical equipment is arranged or are you asking like what's the system for no so you were very clear actually go back to your plant if you wouldn't mind like you you were very clear and intentional about how you have the vertical cords for circulation um, mm -hmm. is the intention that one or more of those is also kind of the home for, for the servicing of this building or how does yes. that work? Yes, so all services are meant, uh, or servicing is meant to be run through the cores. Um, the, uh, like the condenser and compressors are on top of the elevator cores, uh, for example. So there's one per each core. Um, since the building is kind of arranged in like little blocks here and there, um, there's like mechanical equipment attached to each block and then it all um, it, it all runs through the uh, the central core in order to uh, reach the condenser or compressor. And that's all awesome and I'm, I'm excited to kind of hear you and I can I can visually make the diagram you're, you're talking through which is awesome. I think the other aspect of that though is that in your really beautiful exposed renderings there's a whole bunch of crap that's going to end up in those spaces right and mm -hmm. And I totally know why you didn't draw it because that stuff's ugly um, and that's okay. Um, but at the same time, mm -hmm. like, that's the same level of evolution and thinking that at some point, you know, you're, you're going to be working on a building that wants to have all these beautiful exposed things and somebody's going to ask you, where does this live? Or your engineering team is going to draw it and just tell you it has to go here and it's going to be of X dimension. Um, mm -hmm. And the coordination aspect of that makes a, it, it really does impact the experience pieces of the space. Yeah. So the thing is, I actually completely wanted all of the mechan all of the mechanical mm -hmm. equipment and everything to be exposed. I am like, I don't have uh, any like there. There's no real space in the walls for anything other than a little bit of insulation because I fully intended for all of that ugly stuff to be yep. clearly visible running through the entire building. Mm -hmm. Like this is meant to be just as functional as physically possible. And that, cause I think that's one of the things that is also so appealing about like industrial plants or warehouses is that everything just functions as it is. And the attractive quality of it or the spatial quality of it comes from the arrangement in order to be the most functional. Mm -hmm. And so I like the interior condition here, like the walls are just unfinished OSB and you can see the steel structure that's, um, you can like st see the steel columns that they're attached to in order to hold up the beams and mm -hmm. uh, so on. Like that's all meant to be exposed. You can absolutely and completely run services exposed through this, which is totally what I wanted. But I think mm -hmm. you're, so yeah. Since uh, we are just coming up on 45 minutes, so I'm gonna ask for a few uh, final comments. I had one observation maybe, um, you know, I think the, the, the question of the height came up and the, the question of the width of the plan. Mm -hmm. So, and, and that that relation, that ratio obviously sort of like makes your project um, somewhat of a, of a wall as a, as a type. Um, mm -hmm. And like, I'm almost like, <laughs> I have to say that I'm almost a little, a little well, disappointed is too strong of work, but um, could there have been more pushback from that type on the spaces that you're creating? Because the the spaces that I'm seeing in your plans actually look look pretty normative. I mean, you still arrange them in the pods and like, so that that creates like all the kind of like enclosure issues and so on. But for me, the, the, the pod the disconnect the kind of thermal enclosure from each other is, is not even, even actually kind of the main, it, it could be one component, but the width of the plan is actually for me just as if not more interesting. So like, how, how do you arrange a hotel room in a, plan that I don't know how wide your plan is right now but like you know let, like give it half of it how do you mm -hmm. deal with sort of questions of structure like when the wind load hits that plan and mm -hmm. um you know I mean like I, I think I think that that pushback to me would have been super interesting to kind of and, and like it, it could have led you to places that you didn't know it existed in, in some ways like because of, of that constraint it's like no let's let's make it a little bit thinner mm -hmm. um yeah. And, and that's that's not I mean that's that's not as much as a critique but like more of a suggestion of like wow this, there's sort of like something inherent in this project that I think could become more extreme and at some stage it would probably break and like not work anymore and like I think that that sort of fine line is always to me very interesting. Mm -hmm. I agree with that like figuring out how to kind of like the the whole building hangs between the columns in every case. And where are there places where like it could have been pushed more extreme to engage those columns in different kinds of ways or relationships and what kind of spatial conditions might that have created that would have sponsored or supported 
a different experience of the structure or you know are there ever moments in even in the breezeway conditions where it's just circulation space that is more forgiving for that kind of work that that you engage those columns in different ways um, mm -hmm. as part of the experience on that and just how do you like you're always between them can you ever walk past yeah. it, you know mm -hmm. as part of that yeah no i think you're right that's definitely a missed opportunity it's something that i could have just like had the columns in to deal with circulation. and you might find that it doesn't work but just something to test out and see what is that experience and does it add value mm -hmm. yeah oh cisco your mic is off um thank you ariella um if you would take down your screen share um we're going to go on to lucy and leah mm -hmm. are you all there yes there they yes. are you're up. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, this project actually began, um, Leia and I, for our um, research for this project, um, looked into lifestyle of truckers on the road as part of the programmatic element. Um, and we were kind of interested in why and when they stay in hotels instead of staying in their, just the cabs of their trucks. Um, a lot of it is just getting that space, interacting with people and R&R &R that they need um, after long journeys on the road. Um, and so a driving force in our project was to make each hotel room um, as special as the
Okay. Can you all see this? Yes. Yes. Okay. So the studio is called Boundary Effects. And I'm going to move past this slide because it tends to mesmerize me and I can't talk while I'm looking at it. Uh, <laughs> but the idea, the general uh, uh, the issue around which the studio was structured was this idea of boundaries or edge conditions. And um, built into that premise is that edges are never just uh, lines without dimension. They always generate activities around the boundary or uh, uh, thicknesses, zones. Um, they're always zones. They're never uh, simply lines or planes. Um, and therefore, they're spatial. They're inherently spatial. They're, uh, one word I like to use is they're territories. And so I came up with a site and a program that was uh, designed simply to foreground this idea of uh, edges as something that architecture is very uh, well suited to condition. So the site is um, in a little town called Morgan's Point. This is sort of in the far eastern edge of Houston. Um, and it's here where this orange circle is. Uh, it's a, it's a, a settlement, a town, which has been there for a while. Um, and this white line is the Houston Shipping Channel. So down to the bottom uh, uh, of this white line is Galveston Bay and the Gulf of Mexico. And then the Houston Shipping Channel winds up and to the left of here is Houston. Um, and uh, this peninsula uh, was originally a, a settlement and there is a, a, a cut. Uh, it was originally a creek, it's called Barber's Cut. And that is a shipping terminal that, uh, uh, that belongs to the Port of Houston, which is a series of ports along the, the channel. And it is a containerized shipping uh, port. Um, and uh, you know, containerized shipping kind of came along in the 60s and has experienced tremendous growth. And so what's happened over the past decades is the footprint of this port um, has grown larger and larger. Uh, so you can see here, there's, a, there's some railroad sidings there's a, a large sort of boulevard, which is mostly trafficked by trucks dropping off and picking up containers. And this whole yard is basically a, a gigantic flat pavement of concrete uh, that is mostly inhabited by stacks of containers. Along the edge, it's, it, there are these huge uh, cranes servicing, removing the containers from the ship. And then towards the road, there's a, there's a scattering of buildings, which are for uh, administrative functions for the port, as well as parking spaces for cars and trucks and that sort of thing. Um, the remainder of the of the settlement or town is on the south side of the peninsula, and it's a pretty modest uh, settlement. Uh, smaller houses, not particularly dense along the water. There are some so there are some really grand houses, um, but as the port expanded over time, it essentially engulfed more and more of what used to be part of the town. And the site itself is this little rectangle, this little square. It's about a 300 foot or three by 300 foot um, square, which is the historic cemetery uh, for the town. Uh, it used to be embedded in the town. Now it's embedded in the, in the container yard. Um, and it was, it, it originally occupied a sort of hilltop, a very gentle hill. Um, and as the container yard uh, encroached upon the cemetery, um, it has ended up about five or six feet higher than the, the relatively flat concrete of the container yard. So there is a grade change condition. Um, you can see this is the container port, the cut, the turning basin at the end, and across the, on the other side of the cut is really just fill as they've dredged this canal, the sh shipping channel wider and deeper over the years, they just keep piling up the dredge material and uh, the ground condition in this whole area is very man-made, it's very artificial. And you can see the cemetery peeking out in the corner right there. At the top is the one of the, the largest, the most grand uh, kind of uh, buildings along the water on the other side of that peninsula. And the site itself is this cemetery. Um, you know, this, this top view makes it look bigger than it actually feels in person because it's a panoramic view, but this is a picture taken from the front gate looking in. It's a uh, it's not particularly large. It has a number of mature trees uh, in the field of the cemetery. And all around the edge, there's sort of a tumble down condition where uh, the grade drops off um, uh, as it approaches the tall chain link and razor wire fence between the cemetery and the port. The port obviously has a perimeter, a secure perimeter. 
Um, and there's quite a bit of vegetation. You can see in the aerial, it looks like it's very, uh, it's, it's pretty dense, um, but the trees there are all, um, are all volunteer vegetation and not particularly like the nice trees are all the ones in the middle of the cemetery. Um, so the, the idea behind picking this, this site was the students essentially had to occupy that seam between the cemetery and the port, right? At the port, they need the, the ground surface to stack containers and to, uh, you know, operate the, the, the operations of the port. Uh, in the cemetery, you know, they, the ground uh, belongs to the dead people. And so the only place to build really is on the edge condition between <coughs> the cemetery and the port. And that edge condition varies a little bit, but it's between, it's about 30 feet wide on most edges of the cemetery. Um, this uh, to the right was the original entrance to the cemetery and parking lot. And you enter, you enter right here. Uh, maybe about six years ago, the port paid to have the entrance moved. So you come in here now and you park right here and then you move up into the cemetery there. And they did that so they can eventually take over this little piece of ground and connect it to the rest of the port operation. Um, yeah, but one of the, uh, you know, the cemetery itself is, is a almost surreal condition. Like at times it, you feel like you're in a very traditional uh, cemetery and it is still active. There are some graves that are almost a century old, but it's not full and there's some much more recent graves as well. But it's surrounded by this extremely active kind of uh, industrial operation. So these big post Panamax cranes, and they're huge, you can sort of see a switchback stair on this one, winding up there. Um, those are uh, moving and moving containers and they slide up and down the edge of the, the water's edge. Um, uh, and there's, there, there's three shifts, the port operates 24 seven. So at night, the cemetery is never dark because the tall lights of the port are shining across the trees and into the cemetery. There's, you know, vehicles backing up and you hear the acoustic noises and the engine noises of those vehicles. Um, so although at times it, it looks quite normal, it in fact is uh, you really have a sense of the operations of the port when you're in the cemetery. There's a few other images to give you a sense. This is the parking lot. And this, uh, this left-hand image kind of shows that five to six foot of elevation difference between the level of the port, which is even with the parking lot, and the cemetery, which is, you know, up, up a little bit. Um, you know, the soils in, in and around Houston are all clay, and so the cemetery actually also has some drainage problems. It's odd because it is elevated, but the terrain is uneven enough that water puddles, um, and, uh, and some students have, have solutions to address that. Um, I put this in here because the students built this group site model and then they never got to use it, but it gives you a sense of the scale. This is the transect between the road, which is, again, mostly trafficked by trucks, and the water's edge where the, where the ships dock. So that's the site. Um, in terms of program, it's a mixed-use program, and the intent was to do that because uh, there's all these boundary this boundary condition that exists on the site, but I was also interested in the, the boundaries between different users and different programs within the building as a potential subject uh, to access in this, in this studio. So the three primary uh, uses are for those visiting the cemetery, uh, there's a meeting hall or chapel, an assembly space uh, with a few associated uses like a few administrative offices and service spaces. Um, the second use is for the port stevedores, the, the, the workers who work on, in the yard of the port and administer it. Um, as it is now, those uses are kind of scattered across a number of different buildings within the port. Uh, but that program is essentially some more traditional administrative space, like people working on computers, but also a place for the, uh, the folks who are out on the yard itself to use the bathroom, to eat lunch, take a break, um, uh, to clean up a little bit or, you know, make a phone call, something like that. And then the third use um, is for, is essentially a, a residency use. It's a hotel. Um, and there's a tremendous amount of uh, trucker traffic uh, coming into and out of this port. Uh, generally speaking, um, they are only in the 
perimeter of the port, within the port itself, the secure perimeter of the port when they're dropping or picking up containers. Uh, but there is a need for truckers to stay overnight. And so this is a gas station that's just, just west of the site. And it has a 22 room hotel that is for truckers almost exclusively on its second floor. And I thought it was gonna be this amazing kind of weird place and we bribed our way in to get a tour. And it was a almost completely conventional hotel, you know, hallway down the middle and 10 rooms on each side. So that wasn't worth it, but, uh, uh, but there's a real need for that. And that's the third piece of the program. One of the things we discovered when the students were doing their research is uh, the ship's crews for these, these big container ships, you know, it used to be it took a long time when cargo was loose to unload or load a ship. Now, when it's all containerized with these big machines, uh, it's typically an 18 max 24 hour turnaround time for these ships to be unloaded or loaded. And so there really isn't time for the crews on the ships to leave the port and get into town and stay in town. So uh, typically they will stay in the port and currently the port has facilities right now for, uh, for ship crews to stay overnight while their ships being loaded or unloaded. So that third component, it was up to the students. It could be for the truckers, it could be for the ship crews, um, but essentially some sort of overnight stay with associated programs like laundry or a little market um, uh, uh, spaces that the, the truckers or ship crews might use um, while they're staying in the hotel. So those, three, those are the three program components um, that the students were challenged to, to have. And I won't go through this in detail, but this is the program that we work together to make. But it's again, the meeting hall chapel, the lodging program, and then the port services program. And there was quite a bit of uh, variability um, in size. Uh, in terms of net square footage, it was somewhere between 12,000 and 30,000 square feet. Uh, when you gross it up, it becomes more like 22,000 to 47,000 square feet uh, in terms of building size, gross building size. And there were a few outdoor spaces that they were asked for, both for the chapel space and the uh, port services space as well. So they'll, you'll, you'll get a sense of the program as, as you see the projects. And then just you know, two quick notes about the process. Um, uh, after our initial phase of doing research, uh, uh, programmatic and historical, we did two exercises. Um, and the first I called a uh, ligature transect. Ligature is like, uh, we don't do this in, in English, but when you glue two letters together, like AE, um, you know, that's a ligature. But it's this idea that when there's two adjacent conditions, the kind of uh, the, the connection between those two conditions is kind of a potent moment. And so they were essentially asked to do a model, a study model, uh, where they looked at the boundary without having designed their building, the a potential architectural condition for the boundary between chapel and port, uh, and also a boundary condition between two of those interior programs. So it's just kind of a, um, a way of of bookmarking a possible architectural a set of architectural devices or architectural syntax that might be uh, that might grow out of this idea of boundary conditions, both external in terms of the site or internal in terms of program. And so that was a week long exercise. And then we did a second week long exercise, which I called affect constitution. This is one I've done before where I asked the students to do two drawings, one of which has to do with like what the experience of the building might be like either internally or externally, and one which is a drawing that somehow begins to get at what its constitution is, like what it's made out of, uh, what its uh, assembly might, uh, might begin to, what, what it might possibly be. And again, that's also an effort to try and get at those uh, possible intentions directly rather than starting with the spatial planning of a complex program and then backing into those things late in the process. Um, so that all of that, the research and these two exercises, that took about five weeks or so, maybe six, including the group site model. And then they've been working for 10 weeks or so on the design and development of their project. So that's, um, figure out how to stop show. Okay, here we go. Uh, so that's sort of essentially the, the, how the studio was, was framed. Um, and like I said, we're going to look at two, two projects in this session. Um, and if, 
if you all have any questions, feel free to ask them. Uh, but if not, I'll, I'll, I'll launch the first group. What's the uh, foundation condition? So, yeah, so it's all fill. It's very soupy. You'll see most of the students have piles um, okay. underneath, piles and pile caps underneath their buildings. But the ground is stable. It's not going to sink. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's uh, it, within the cemetery. It's, I mean, it's not swamp, yeah. but it has very fairly low bearing capacity because um, it's clay and fill. Okay, Andrea, Amanda, do you all want to share screen and, and start your presentation? Yes, absolutely. Just one moment. Okay, can you all see that? Yes. Okay. Okay, so, um, well, first of all, good afternoon and thank you for joining us for today's review. Um, we wanted to start, we're Amanda and Andrea, by the way, and we wanted to start our presentation with our affects drawing, one of our earlier exercises in the strip, which basically captures the three landscapes of the site that our design is going to um, intend to address. So from left to right, we have the port with this sea of containers, uh, a band of the sky, uh, and lastly, the cemetery with the vegetation. And where, what our design is gonna try to do is take these three landscapes and frame them in different ways. That makes sense for the user group. So this is a site, and as you can see, the cemetery is lost inside the port. Um, you can see the north-south axis has large and noisy shipping cranes, um, but the east and, <coughs> sorry, the east and west axis have less acoustical pollution being just businesses and storage. Okay, so these are another earlier exercises. It's a constitution drawing and an affect. And basically the two most important aspects of this drawing that were consequential to the development of our project are um, two main things. The first one that we always wanted uh, an elevated building that um, would only be possible with a uh, with a very structurally expressive um, kind of look. And um, also that takes elements of the tectonic of the cranes and exposes them in, in building form. And also this idea of taking components of the site like the containers and their textures to create spaces. So with that in mind, this is our final proposal for the site. There are three building bars the first being the bar near the parking lot at ground level, and the other two on the north side of the site as elevated bars, which are raised visually to block the post Panamax sized cranes. The structure of the elevated bars is by four structural cores creating two bridge like buildings. 26 foot tall plat trusses span almost 300 feet of the site using a large scale to relate to the port. Okay, so having that uh, final team in mind, we talk a little bit about how that came to be. Um, we identified that the problem in the site that we wanted to tackle was the excessive, excessive exposure of the, now the port operation into the cemetery. The cemetery is overpowered by all that ceramic chaos. And our first instinct was to just shield uh, the, the total area of the cemetery with an elevated mass on top. But we soon realized that that was um, exaggerated and unnecessary for what we wanted trying to do. As we studied more in depth um, the grain of that surrounding chaos, we realized that the north axis is the one that we really wanted to um, impair the vision to because it's, uh, it has more movement and it's more noisy with the movement of the cranes, whereas this is stacked containers with no noise associated. Um, so that's when our layered um, the scheme came to be with three with three masses, um, and we placed we spent a deal of time playing with elevations and how to place these masses in 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 the air to impair vision to their crane. And we ended up with uh, the first mass, which is the, the a threshold building and an entry point for the cemetery, and two masses that sort of create a a new boundary condition in between them. This a space that is that we we use so we actually dropped the level of the cemetery eight feet and so this 
a space feels like an extension of the port and it actually serves the port, but it's a different condition. It's supposed to be a break area, an outdoor break area for the stevedores that are all day in the sun. And with the masses of the building, we would create a shaded place. Finally, our last strategy is called selective exposure, and it's about providing each user with the views that they are fight for. So the visitors of the cemetery get views of the new cemetery that's elevated, and and the users of the port get uh, a view, a band of the sky, and the port operations staff gets views of the overall operation of the port from an elevated point of view. So to the right, there's a threshold building, and to the left of that is the new cemetery building, and the building closest to the port is the offices and the hotel. As you can imagine, the site section standing within the cemetery, the elevated masses obstruct the view of the cranes. Here, um, this is basically the summary of our entire project. Um, this section perspective shows this dance of landscape that we're trying to address, being the port, the sky, and the cemetery. Um, so this is the port operation building, and from top to bottom, we have uh, a, uh, an open plan office at the top. Um, in this view, we're seeing a double height gym for the use of not only the people that work in the offices, but uh, the hotel um, uh, guests. And finally, this last level is a post-tension concrete uh, outdoor mezzanine that's for um, the use of, um, again, the, the people that work in the offices or the people that are staying in the hotel. And also for tourists, because it provides a long and elongated view of the, of the port. It's about exposing the port. Um, and this area is um, where the city doors enter, it's kind of the square light, square light, public square space that is, um, it's supposed to be shaded just because of the massing of the buildings. We spend a great deal of time uh, studying the shadows for this space. Um, and finally, we have to the uh, right the new cemetery, which has an open facade to the ground cemetery. And um, it, it's um, and this hardscape uh, below, that's where you access it through the core, through the structural core. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, so this is a plan of the threshold building, which is the bar that is not elevated. It contains a chapel for anyone who is having ground burial in the existing cemetery. On the north end of that same level, this plan shows the edge of the cemetery. At this level, the northmost bar is a mezzanine for the trucker, yes, the hotel, which looks into the port. Being between two of the four structural cores, there's limited access keeping the port secured. The port workers can access the offices through the north course where the cemetery users can enter using the south side of the course. And this is our hotel level from which to the left we have the more public spaces. This is a gym and uh, the gym that we're seeing in the section perspective. And this is an outdoor bridge area that it's um, sort of an entertainment center with a bar um, for the guests of the hotel. And all of this are double occupancy rooms for the truckers. Uh, we went for a more hostel-like uh, style with a communal bathroom and, and you know, public com uh, community spaces to share. Um, on the upper level, we have an open plan with offices and the first level of our new cemetery that we're proposing. Um, basically, that it, this is a, an elevated chapel, a structural core, column variants, and this light wells that are supposed to connect program vertically and let light in. This is very similar, again, an open plan for offices and um, the mezzanine of the new cemetery. I know I want you to notice uh, all the vertical um, openings. So light, the openings that we have would cascade light uh, through the building. The drawing on the top is the main elevation of this new cemetery that is uniform and solemn. This neutral and clean facade faces the existing cemetery while taking in part of blocking the port sounds and sights. Below is a section through the new cemetery where you can see on either side, there's two structural cores with the overhang on the left being an elevated chapel and on the right, uh, the overhang is services. 
in this zoomed view of those drawings, you can see the space of the chapel, there's columbarians, and on the right, there's a skylit courtyard. And on the other hand, the facade that looks into the port, it's, uh, it's not supposed to be uniform, it's supposed to run to the different circumstances of the port, and actually we played with the composition to make it look like a spike container, so the facade is supposed to blend in um, with the composition and colors of the port. And the only element that breaks that horizontal composition is are uh, these egresses there that are actually oriented, um, aligned with the grid of the port, which is different than the grid of the cemetery. And it's supposed to be a wayfinding element um, that you can from different uh, points of the port. This is the view of the gym and the hotel and office building. We chose this view because it shows the layers through the structure with expression of the truss versus the micro perforated panels and the glass giving views out to the port. In the wall section, you can see the micro perforated facade is hanging from smaller trusses on the roof. And um, as a, in contrast, uh, different kind of spaces and spaces that we have in the new cemetery, in which the structure is still visible through this very fine grain micro perforated metal, but we have decided to sandwich this. Um, the trusses, the big trusses that are holding up the whole building um, with this layer um, because the idea of the cemetery was to create more intimate spaces that have a relationship vertically to the sky and the light coming in and the trees that are in the ground level um, for, for grieving. And, but it's still framing the views of the ground cemetery. This render brings us back to that idea of the three stripes from the first page. To the left, there's the frame view of the port, and then up there's the slit of the sky, and to the right is a cemetery. The retaining wall serves for security of the port, but it also acts as a way to frame the view of only the trees so the stevedores are not looking into the cemetery, rather giving them a view of just vegetation in their break area. And finally, this is, um, we wanted to close our presentation with showing this, which is a summary of all the small moments that we created in our exploration of not only landscape boundaries, but also the layering of a structure and, um, and screen to create in exciting new boundary conditions in the interior as well. So um, these are, this is a way to embrace the online format. These QR codes can be scanned with their phones so you can see a more photorealistic rendition of our spaces um, to look around. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. I'm uh, trying to understand the orientation. You have this double perforated wall that's next to the rooms. What is it? Is that what side of the building is that? Is that north or? Uh, this is looking uh, to the port, yes, to the north. That's looking north. So the yes. perforation isn't about sun, it's about privacy or sort of filtering the view. Uh, it's a shading device as well. Um, and it's supposed we it's supposed to be aligned with certain spaces that need more shade and the spaces that we want to expose the port operation is just um, the, the screen is not there and it's just glass. Yeah, as far as elevation looking from the port into the building, that it looks kind of like containers. So you're saying it's, but it it's on the north side of the building. So you're you're looking at the extreme summer sun. Is that? Uh, shade in the view. I'm sorry. Uh, I guess this is the elevation that goes to the port, and there's some parts that is um, just the glass, um, and some areas that are more permanent um, that is uh, have the screen. But um, the the the, com the placement of it um, has to do with shading the interior, but it has to do also with uh, with a gaming composition of them. Um, that what well, we're looking as we are outside in the port. You want it to look like containers? Is... Yeah, we want it to blend in. I guess I'm trying to understand. You have this. You have the space, and the ob the obvious thing to do would be to ring it with buildings, and they all face in or they all face out. And I'm trying to understand the orientations of the various parts of your of your piece. I, that, um, I think section perspective. I think yeah, this view would be useful for that. I'm sorry. Well, yeah. Here, um, this is that facade, 
the interior facade has mostly cloth stuff with some um, win some windows uh, very uh, specific to look at the square like space. This is completely closed off um, because we didn't want a relationship of the cemetery people with uh, what's happening in the port. And this is um, completely open. This, those are our four facades. I think I'm also trying to understand uh, the the building on the right has this this is this huge hundred plus foot span, and the truss is internal. So there are these pieces that cantilate. I'm trying to under. It seems like it's it's more complex than just this box truss. It's got pieces that cantilever out on both sides, and then I look what looks like bar joists spanning the other way. Am I reading this correctly? That well, actually, the one on the other side, the one that's floating. Yeah, we have um, this and just um, the, truss, the trusses that are yeah. uh, going to the course. And in the other direction, we have ID um, concealed in the ceiling. And I think what you're reading is bar joists or not bar joists. There's some sort of ceiling hanger system. Oh, oh yeah. OK. OK. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We'll open those, yeah. But, but the building on the left, there, there are columns in that somewhere. They're just, or is there a truss there as well? Uh, there's a truss here, and this level is sort of hanging off of that truss. And the post tension uh, bridge is coming from the, course. from from the course. Well, I guess I think this is a is a it's a very rich section. I I uh, it does. I mean, there's no right or wrong answer. You know, I, my my first impulse is okay. Well, if you want, all the rooms should face into the cemetery because that's probably quiet. And uh, but that's not there's not a right or wrong. You know, looking at a cemetery could be pretty <laughs> pretty. I don't know, depressing. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, there's not a right or wrong answer. I guess. Uh, I guess I'm trying to understand not just that the chapel side as well. Like you've got all these parts and you've got these programs that don't really fit together. I mean, the, the chapel and the containers and maybe they work well together, maybe not. I, I guess I, particularly looking at this section, it seems like there's a real opportunity at ground level. I guess what's the gym, you know, if, it seems like a room could look underneath the, uh, the building on the right and see into the, uh, into the cemetery, it, it seems like there's an opportunity there that you're not. Yeah, right where you you put your your mouse, that you could be a, mm -hmm. a connection through there. Maybe there is somewhere else where I can't see it, but it. it yeah, the plan maybe can show. We do have like yeah. a window. So, uh, yes, the rooms are faced um, to the port, just because, like you said, if there's no right or wrong answer, and we felt like we didn't want people necessarily looking into. Um, the cemetery and more of a not because the view is, wouldn't be nice with the vegetation, but the, the conceptual idea of a cemetery. You know, once and then to look at that, we uh, we had it to have a more closed off facade here um, and just a balcony that they can decide if they want to go or not. And in this hallway, what we have is just windows to show certain moments. So this here's a window. You would look at a tree, but it's not, you know. It's not, it's not in your room, uh, does that make sense? And the communal spaces do have a window, but the shading of it, this shape right here is going to point down to the Cibidor square area instead of, um, you know, looking out in front directly to the cemetery. So, well, there's I, no, I'm sorry. great. Oh, I was just going to ask one one question about the the drop, the eight foot drop that you took in the site. Did that affect any of the cemetery at all? Like, was that part of the cemetery? Or was that actually part of the port? Uh, so we actually let's go back to uh, maybe here is the best way. So we we receded the edge of the cemetery um, because the majority of the graves are in the south corner here there are very few graves and we decided uh, when we dropped the 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 ground yes we would have to move some okay. graves 
Um, although there is a difference between the cemetery level and the court level, the six feet, we just increase it by two feet. Okay. Were you finished, Ed? I didn't want to. I'm just, I'm trying to. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to interrupt you. Um, I do have a few, few sort of comments along the same lines. Go ahead. Um, um, so I appreciate like your thoroughness in terms of addressing the cemetery and the port and the very specificity of actually engaging those actually as rooms, right? In terms of the way that your buildings address them on both sides and then sort of make this transition between the two, which happens to be this space with that dropped eight feet, you know, where the stevedores are. And my question, I guess, and, and also just generally really nice presentation. You know, we can all say that probably about everybody's, but um, nice presentation, clear, uh, both in the drawings and in the, in, in the presentation itself. But one of the things that I'm having a hard time figuring out is the relationship between the two buildings, like how the two buildings are either not talking to each other in that sort of what I feel like is like this critical space that you've created in between the two, which is this sort of slice of sky, right? That is in your initial diagrams. And that the people that get to experience that are the stevedores, right? Cause they're kind of up and under. And then when you're up on the, um, on the cemetery, there's really no view right through that part so I'm feeling a little bit and, and I'm having a hard time reading the relationship from your drawings I think that's a, maybe a little bit something that's missing is that transition or the lack of it and that because I feel like that's a really critical part of your project and everything else is so well thought out in the layering within the building and then without on both sides um, I feel like that's a little bit of something that's missing for me in terms of how you guys are thinking about that space you know what it's actually doing so maybe we can refer back to this. Yeah, um, that's perfect. Yeah. So um, no, there is no relationship between the two buildings. Um, we deliberately uh, made this the outer facade very open and the inner facade very close. Um, to so the stevedores would have like a framed view of the sky um, with this very solid wall, and we also didn't feel it was necessary for um, this building to have a relationship with what's happening here and vice versa, maybe we decided to open a few windows that you can sort of see here to frame certain moments to do with vegetation. But the idea from the beginning was that the site, um, we wanted to, to provide each user group with the views that they're interested in or the reason why they're in the complex. So if they're there to greet someone, they have this you know, visuals or have connections to the new cemetery and the, it's between the ground and the building. Um, and for the port, it's between the port operations, their break area, and this um, and this guy. But between each other, between the two structures, necessarily, no, it was intentional to to leave that um, unconnected. Okay. Even visually, right? Like when you look out the windows from one, it's a framed view of something that is not transparent into the other. Right? Like if there yes. is an app, are there apertures in there? I think there are selected ones, right? Yes, in this one there are apertures. In this one, no, no. Okay, none good. at all. All right. Hmm. Well, Marla, they were first and foremost a great presentation. Um, I, the tying all together the graphic convention that you did is really really nice. The only thing I can say, and I think you're kind of picking this up from some of the comments right now, is the abstraction of your drawings, with the exception of this one or to some extent making it a little difficult for any of us to really tell what's going on. It's something you'd want to balance out next time. I would comment that, so I reviewed this at mid-review and you have definitely skillfully taken a position and I see that you know many of the comments that happened at mid-review when I was looking directly into the columbarium from the hotel you decided to go against that. And I know a couple of people thought that the degree to which the view was directly into the columbarium was probably not what the stevedores were going to be wanting. Um, I have a difficult time knowing what the quality of those spaces, you've got your mouse on one of them and on the tension bridge, or, or I guess the post-tension bridge with the little guy. 
uh, a little left. Um, I don't know what the quality, yes. I don't know what the quality of those spaces are right now, you know, but I do like the fact that you've taken a position and very thoroughly worked through some of the comments you got, rejected some of the others, and have worked to tie the program in with polarized views. And the thing that I think is great about that is that whether or not, like, uh, like Ed said, there, there are no right answers, but I think the important thing is that you're taking a position right now. Beforehand, it was a sort of a, a bit where every, all of these things had a sort of a, an intermingling and an intermixing in a way that took almost no position. Like, why was I looking into the columbarium? And the place downstairs where the stevedores were all going to be smoking, they were all kind of like up in the middle of cemetery world. Um, I think what you've done here is a very, very skillful. That I don't necessarily agree with all of them. It doesn't really, really matter. Um, I do think that having thoroughly walked through and said, okay, we aren't going to have apertures into the columbarium and I'm going to try to polarize this view from the gym out towards, you know, the, the more attractive part of the property in the cemetery where now if I am up at that higher level at the cemetery, I'm under shade, I'm not in the middle of a, like all the dudes smoking and eating lunch. I think you, I think you've done a pretty nice job putting all that stuff together. I do think, you know, you had the little OCR things at the end to uh, try to show what the, the more rendered views would look like. And I know that those probably would have been speed bumps in your presentation. And I was desperately trying to figure out how to do it on an Android, but I couldn't. So I don't know what it looks like. I will say at a certain point, you need to make sure that your graphic convention, while, while beautiful, doesn't get in the way of communicating what you're trying to communicate. Because some of the drawings, the plans and things get abstract enough that everybody keeps saying, come back to this drawing, because it's really the only one where we can see what's happening, right? The other ones, you can if you study them, but they're, they're, they're getting a bit to where it's almost like the graphics are impeding the communication. I think what you did here is skillful. Um, so, can I come um, back and finish her? <laughs> no, sorry about that. Uh, I'm sorry. Did I? I. Uh, I guess. Um, so you did this in Revit, right? Is that? I mean, did, was it Revit from day yeah, you know, step right. one? Yeah. And uh, Revit's wonderful because you it's you're literally putting the parts together. I mean, it's like assembling a building. I, I, it, it seems like a, if you don't work, don't actually use it, it seems like such a wonderful idea because you're just, you have the I-beam or your wide flange and you're putting it there. I think, um, and I look at this, I see this uniform sandwich, which is quite plausible. You know, the, the, the hung ceiling and the, and it's pretty much a uniform plane. And, uh, and I agree that this, there's a lot more most of the information is in this drawing right here, not just technical, but I think architectural. But uh, I sort of feel, although there's a lot of richness in this section, it seems like there could be a, more in the scheme. And I, uh, I guess what seems really undercooked is the. Uh, I agree with the comments about about uh, competence and and um, thoroughness and so forth. I think you know. What would interest me about this project is the cemetery in the middle of this industrial God knows what, you know, and that if you say somebody's going to be have a funeral there, they're going to go to the chapel, they're going to have the hearse, they're going to go out and bury them, they're going to do all the things that you do at a at a uh, at a funeral. And it's a pretty. It only happens to everybody once, and and it's an incredible architectural event. So that would be an interesting thing. And your your the front building, the low building seems rather, uh, it seems far too, it seems like a Revit building. The chapel is just like all the other uh, uh, rooms in that space. It's just a bar that's been filled in with, with program. And I, I can't think of a building that's less suitable for that kind of, of treatment. Uh, you know, this, the hotel maybe, so I, I wish some of the richness that went into this section had found its way into the building across the way. So that's a, a big point for me. I, another point I think has to do with this 
maybe it's a sunshade, maybe it's a a a, a, a filter, a visual filter. It seems like okay, we're we're going to look at the container. We're going to look at the shipping container and and uh, make something of an architecture. That's going to be the imagery for this this thing. And uh, I've never I've heard a sugar band say this out loud once. I've never heard it. He's just talking about an awful thing a shipping container is. They're, you know, they're not made for for people. They're just they're really narrow. And they're, they're kind of over designed and they're over heavy. So I guess I wish that that. I don't call it a metaphor. That trope either had something deeper, or maybe maybe you say, "I'm going to use the material. I'm going to use the steel. I'm going to use the part, you know, the parts of the container." Because it seems, I have to say, a little bit glib to me that you've got this facade of shipping container modules. That's really is just that. It's it's not. It is somewhat related to what's going on behind, but it seems like if that was important, it should have had more. It should have been gone beyond the surface in some way. Uh, so those are the two big things. I, again, I, I, I'm wondering, uh, I've tried doing Revit Studios and they, they do have this kind of built in, uh, uh, oh, well, I won't go into it anyway. <laughs> I, I, I wonder about, despite all the richness in this section, I look at the ceiling and I just see this, this you know, meticulously detailed hung ceiling flowing across the space and it's very, uh, it's like Cole House or, or Corbusier, you know, it's this, this, the modern space. It's, it's very flexible. You can move walls around and so forth, but you're not really using it that way. You, you've actually got a space that's not flexible. It's not a criticism. It's, you know, the, it's got a gym and a bar and all this stuff. And yet I think the, the, the sort of basic element, uh, which in this case is a really delivery mechanism, that is the floor ceiling sandwich, that's where the, um, uh, services are going to go through seems, uh, I don't know, it seems to be another opportunity uh, there that different rooms might have different different treatments and so forth. There are a few little things I'm, you know, I'm wondering about parapets. Uh, I'm wondering, you know, I wouldn't expect to see a mechanical system maybe in a building like this, but I want to know where it would go when the, the, uh, uh, when the time came. And it looks like your ceiling's pretty hard up against your your structure, unless I'm misreading something. But uh, um, I see a duck there. Yeah, there's a duck. Okay, <laughs> not sure. It's, I just wanted to show you the that uh, in the spaces that our ducks are. In this case, it, the ceiling drops a little bit. Uh, here's exposed, and in the cemetery, have this um, very thick. We have a lot of cavity. Um, that we put our dots in they're very light but and then they go down the course to this area this is where the services are concentrated That's it. well i'm not a uh not a mechanical engineer i i i would think we might you might want that air supply closer to the glass i mean you typically you want the warm air moving up a, a glazed surface it's not always possible and um and I think important thing, of course, where where the mechanical seems like a basement is not a good idea here. So, which means your chances of jumping here if I'm way off base, it seems like your chances of having rooftop equipment are pretty strong, and uh, which is okay. But again, uh, I I wonder whether you would want parapets or whether I, or maybe even something to hide the equipment or maybe show it there and say, okay, this. It's not any different than all these containers and other stuff that's around here is going to fit right in. But it seems, uh, but again, I'm sort of pushing forward from what's a pretty competent and I think thought out, well thought out uh, scheme. I, I agree about the comment about the abstraction of the other drawings. I, I appreciate the, uh, the, both the specificity and the, and the, uh, the connection between the architecture and the construction that I see in this drawing. Thank you. Giovanni, did you have some? I think we interrupted you earlier. Yes. Uh, so congratulations. I'm literally dazzled about your project. <laughs> uh, I don't have words. Um, it's, a common, uh, it's not a common solution. Uh, and uh, the sections can explain uh, the entire project. 
uh, it's easy to me uh, considering something uh, about your work, but um, if I have something to to say, is about uh, the cemetery building. Maybe, I don't know, something uh, that I saw uh, in your drawing suggest to me that this building could be uh, much more higher than the hotel and creating uh, a new facade to, do the, to the hotel and uh, um, creating an opportunity to take advantage to the roof of the cemetery building, uh, creating a, a kind of a view deck uh, and a kind of a new atmosphere that can, you can provide to the visitors. I don't know, uh, it's something that occurred to me and uh, maybe could be very interesting. And I miss the, another element, the water. Uh, it's something that uh, uh, Francisco uh, mentioned uh, about uh, the land. And this, this, this water could be uh, quite the connection between the two buildings. I don't know, uh, but it, it's something to think about. Uh, uh, I, 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 this is my my main main comments. Uh, I don't don't have any any more to 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 say, but. I would like to, if I may advise you, uh, take care about the pictures that you create, the imagines, because they are very, they are beautiful, uh, but very abstract. If you have a client, uh, more a common, regular client, uh, maybe I'm afraid uh, he's, uh, maybe he, will have some difficulties to understand, to read the entire building. So take care with the abstract way uh, that you choose to do this image. Mm. But despite that, uh, it was a very good work. Congratulations. Thank you so much. <laughs> if, if I can sneak just one last comment in um, uh, that follows a little bit on Giovanni is that I see these two buildings as like two people that are facing away from each other, right? Basically is, is what I'm talking about and what, you know, some way of connecting them and not making them so like ign just ignoring each other, which I think, you know, has been brought up as like you made that decision and that's, you know, it's a hard line right there. There's a couple of places, you know, like either the water or the ground, you know, that ground treatment that could do that. The other one, and, and this came up when I was looking at your, um, your presentation for the first time like on a202 is your elevation and you have that stairwell that's going up you know like if there's a and we were talking you know talking about a vertical like if there's some moment where you get up high enough where you can peek over you know you can see that cemetery from that side or even from the cemetery side there's some point where there's a slide and you can see around or above you know where there's like this celebrated moment because I think you set it up that way, and I don't think you're adverse to that based on the previous comments from Burton, and that it seems like right now there is a whole lot of tension right there in that center space to me, and and I don't know if that's good or bad yet. Like I'm, you know, I'm just kind of, you know, it's like going back to actually Ed's first comment is like there's no right answer, you know, but I kind of see that. What what's the name of that Star Trek thing that you guys used at the beginning, you know, in your yeah yeah like that to me is what that stairwell should be you know like there should be like a mount on top of that that's you know like i don't know so that's just my last my last sort of cast out over the bow last shot over the bow but really nice and i i did look at your um panoramas and they do help you know because they are more realistic so okay um 
Uh, Andrea, Amanda, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to move on to the, the second project. Thank you very much for thank all you your guys. comments, for helping Thanks. us so much. Bye. Um, Trent, Alex, are you here? Yep. There you are. Hey. Sharing screen now. Can you, can you give me a half a second? I'm going to run over there for a minute. I'll be right back. Sure. I forgot to warn all the critics, but um, the school is live streaming the reviews on YouTube. So, you know, don't incriminate yourselves unless you're in intending to do that. I know, I just said Star Trek instead of Star Wars. That was very embarrassing. <laughs> you're gonna hate mail from the Star Wars people. <laughs> I know. I was a little offended by it. I imagine. I guess while we're waiting, I'll just mention casually that this is process work right now, just so you know that what you're staring at is not final work. It was an early process. Let me start. Okay, ready to go? Yeah, good. Okay, great. So we're Trent and Alex. Um, and wanted to start with some of this earlier process work just because it contains a lot of the seeds of our central ideas. So we really had three central ideas that were guiding us through this project. One was treating this layer um, or treating this boundary between the two different elements of the site, the port and the cemetery, as more of a layered soften condition. Another was trying to highlight and um, accentuate kind of social slippages and overlaps between different user groups in a lot of varied ways and generally as much as possible, getting as much um, kind of visibility to the different people moving through the space. And the third was in the materials and atmospheres of the project to try and use industrial materials as much as possible that can relate to the port, but that can also double and have a more numinous relate to the cemetery. So this is some more of that process work, just speaking to using industrialized panelized materials, variable presence during day at night, um, exploring in some of our early process, this idea of layering from more exterior spaces to more interior ensconced spaces. So all of those ideas were really in reaction to this somewhat surreal, bizarre site condition of a relatively wooded cemetery within this enormous port condition. Um, and we didn't want to totally block off either side. We thought that that condition is somewhat of what makes this space special and there will always be those presences slipping through. Um, so we let that be and oriented the building to one side. We were also thinking about the different user groups coming to this space. You have truckers who are coming in from long trips. They're spending a lot of time um, solitary. They're probably quite lonely after all that time. They want to talk to people, share stories, complain about traffic, something. And in the same way, stevedores are coming in from boat trips where they've been with the same small group of people for a long time, probably want to get out and expand a little bit. And then you have this somewhat contrasting condition of chapel goers who are coming for a more um, secluded and serene experience. So again, that kind of coalesced into these three main ideas that formed the project. One is treating the building as a series of volumes contained within two layers to polycarbonate screens. And those are essentially serving as a metering out and a mediating of this boundary in a softened way, while also having more interiority in the center. Second was this idea of social slippage. So having this variety of um, perception of people around you, whether it be sight, sound, smells wafting through different spaces, always having a sense of life around you, whether or not it's strictly visual um, and an analogy that's kind of guided us and that we've been using a lot to talk about this is the feeling you have when you're on an airplane and you share a window between your seat and the seat in front of you. It's kind of a strange condition where 
you move that window, you know, if you open or close the little screen, you very much know you're affecting the person in front of you. Um, and if they do it, you get a sense of them. Even if you never see them or talk to them, you have that implicit relationship. So bringing in those implicit relationships and kind of highlighting how your actions, how your life through the space affects the others in the space was something we wanted to tie into the project. And then third, again, this idea of materials that have a variable presence that can be both industrial, especially perhaps at night when the cemetery is not being used as much, lights are on, polycarbonate becomes more translucent, um, but also can have a more numinous and refined presence. So we uh, chose to site the building on the western edge of the cemetery, straddling the cemetery and the port. Um, and we did this because um, uh, most uh, people approaching uh, this site are coming from the um, western side. Um, so we wanted to make sure that this building had some sort of a, a, a strong public presence and potentially give um, the port and cemetery a more, um, yeah, a stronger presence to visitors. Um, uh, a little bit more about how we uh, kind of organize the spaces inside. Um, most of the hard program is contained within a series of, of volumes. Um, and the way that we approach this is, is that uh, to the lower right of the second diagram, uh, the truckers are in that um, dark gray bar. Um, and then port workers are housed in the light brown bar. Um, chapel visitors are housed in the orange um, section. And then uh, the hotel space is at the very top of the structure. And the top diagram basically um, uh, starts to show the interstitial space, which we found was a very like special component um, to this kind of program where there are a myriad of different users all coming to this building for different experiences. And we wanted to like highlight the importance of those different types of interactions by creating um, a vast amount of space for social engagement. So all of the void space is um, circulation, a very central staircase and different spots for people to gather. Um, so a quick introduction to kind of the material palette that we were using. Um, we have a series of uh, masonry cores um, that extend up through the, um, the building uh, pictured in the gray. Um, and then a secondary uh, steel structure, which supports the uh, polycarbonate screen, which you can see in the light gray, um, and the hotel rooms, which are clad in the plywood panels. And just to kind of comment again on what Trent said, we wanted to use materials that had a very like industrial presence, but potentially use them in a way that um, had poetic qualities. Um, so getting into more detail about uh, how the different user groups access the site. Um, the lower diagram shows um, the trucker entry. So that is at the same grade as the port level. Um, and they enter in towards a reception space and then move up through the building um, in a central staircase. Uh, the second diagram in the middle shows a chapel access. And this path is sloped up to the chapel level, which is at the same height as the cemetery. Um, about six feet above grade, um, slightly higher than that. Um, and uh, uh, one gesture that we did for this entrance is, is we extended the green space out towards the main road. And there's a very framed, uh, a, a veiled separation between uh, visitors who are entering the space. They do not have a direct view to the um, to the cemetery. So there's a vegetative barrier um, to the right. And then to the left is a, uh, a perforated screen, a grate, um, so a veiled view towards the trucker's entrance. Um, and then the third entrance is the port workers. Um, and they enter at the, um, the back side of the building under a screen through a secure gate. Um, so just a little bit more about these different programs in section. Uh, the top left uh, of the building, or sorry, the lower left of the building is where the port workers enter. You can see the locker rooms, um, a Steve Door specific break room, and then uh, port admin offices, which are housed in the upper portion of the volume. Um, and then to the lower right, um, you can see 
the reception area where the truckers enter and a series of different break spaces for um, uh, these visitors. Um, and then they circulate up through this grand staircase um, to the hotel uh, program volume. And then the third user group is the chapel goers and they enter on this sloped uh, procession to um, the chapel space. Um, and this very long uh, procession has a, a point once you enter the chapel where you turn and that is your first clear view of the cemetery. So yeah, just to reiterate again, this um, section, you can kind of clearly see this relationship between enclosed volumes and this unconditioned interstitial space. So whenever anyone's coming out of one of their specific program volumes, they're entering into this shared space that ties everything together and kind of floats through it all. So in some of these shorter sections, you can see that condition of chapel entry where they're entering on their own kind of graded pathway that's a long procession towards the chapel. And once they enter the chapel, they can move out and access the cemetery. So that moment where they enter the actual chapel space is that first large framed view they're gonna get of this kind of new world that exists within the cemetery, this kind of hidden world within the port. And again, you can see here that what, um, this is the language of using kind of humbler industrial materials, in this case, acoustic felt insulation, um, and trying to give them a more refined quality, use them in a refined way, while also acoustically helping to seal off the chapel from all the noises of the port. In this ground floor plan, you can see again how these entries work. So this is at the grade of the port, and then you have the cut of the higher grade, six feet higher of the cemetery. So you can see this bearing wall here extends and forms um, kind of controlled entry for port workers entering. They can move into their lounge and then move up that central space. Truckers coming in from the right, same thing. They can enter their lounge oriented towards this center social space and then move up that stair. Here you can see that um, condition of where truckers would be entering. The polycarbonate screen is lifted up so that landscape is allowed to slip in and out from under the building and create different spaces while also again accentuating these slippages. And there's this series of kind of sectional changes as you move through the building, it opens up in front of you. So at this level, we see more clearly the um, entrance to the chapel and um, that kind of turn that occurs as you walk up the path. And then once you enter into the chapel, looking out onto the um, cemetery. Um, also housed in this level is the cemetery administration um, area and then a cafe with an outdoor um, dining area for all visitors to the site. Um, this level is more social space and it uh, kind of starts to articulate this uh, sinewy, sinewy um, social staircase that exists within the void space. And here's a perspective starting to look at this staircase, which um, basically provides users from all of the different groups potentially to mix and to interact, whether that's um, some sort of an acoustic relationship, a visual one, sight, yeah, smell. Um, and yeah, so this, this staircase winds its way up um, through the entire building in the void space. Here you can see the first level above that of the hotel volume. So you have this enclosed hotel volume, and then again, interstitial space in between with this catwalk essentially that's suspended between the screen and the hotel volume. And the catwalk is organized with a series of steel plates that are forming the floor. And then there are moments where metal grating below the grates supporting them, the steel grates pull back. So you can start to see through that metal grating. You can see that here. So you get these slips of people above and below you that you're starting to see. And again, these ideas of kind of the slippages are brought into the details where the panelization of the steel is used to create small half inch gaps between them and they can be point welded together. So there's some small slippage, slips of light coming through um, the panelization of the plywood on the hotel rooms is used to form sliding doors that then can slide over adjacent windows and give people a sense of when um, an adjacent room is being entered or not. So this is the second level of um, the hotel uh, bar. Um, and basically it houses yeah, the hotel rooms and a, a small port administration office. Um, and basically these rooms are very cell-like. Um, we wanted them to be, yeah, almost monastic in quality. So they're clad in, at the interior in these metal panels. And then they're um, 
uh, nooks that are carved out um, that are lined with that uh, felt material um, to kind of create these very like interior oriented spaces. Um, but because these are so uh, interior oriented and so confined, we wanted to encourage people to move out into these social spaces if they so desire to interact with people. And the top level is uh, the fitness center, um, an outdoor uh, exercise area, and we chose to enclose our mechanical equipment in a series of screens, um, so they're expressed on the rooftop. You can see the full elevation. This is the east elevation facing the cemetery. Two modes, one where there's a strip of polycarbonate screens that are in various open positions or closed. But here you can start to get a sense of how this polycarbonate screen unifies the facade and during mornings when the sun is shining on it from the east, it's going to make it more opaque and shield cemetery goers from the view of the interior. And here you can see Western facade, port facing, you have the port admin volume, looking out and relating to port operations. And then a series of punches in the polycarbonate facade, two large sections of operable windows in front of those large kind of social gathering spaces. But these punches in the polycarbonate facade, the panelized kind of rigid consistent system is then overlapped with the system of hotels. So there's um, some kind of slips between the placement of the larger windows and the smaller hotel room windows. And one large window will be shared between two or four smaller hotel room windows. So you're getting that kind of shared window experience. And here in an Eastern section elevation, this kind of talks about how some of those ideas, those ideas of layering and slippages are being brought down into the level of detail. So things that are panelized, the plywood that's being expressed with um, raised, um, raising the panels far above the parapet so you can tell that it's a thin layer that's panelized. Um, tracks for those moving doors that are passing in front of small windows in the hotel rooms. Um, sorry, polycarbonate screens that are shingled on this side, so essentially they're overhanging the floor below you by two feet. If you move one of those panels to let in breeze or get a better view, you can start to tell that it's affecting people around you. It'll change light conditions below them. You'll hear that sound. So you get a sense of this life throughout the building, even if you're not seeing the person move it explicitly. And then the bottom floor, there's a system of permeable pavers that allow some grass to slip in and start to creep in between them. So uh, this perspective revisits our initial uh, concept perspective on the uh, first slide, but uh, basically um, our mission with this project was rather than uh, separating these two vastly different site conditions, um, the active port and the cemetery, our building stretches out and elongates along this edge to um, soften this edge and kind of create uh, conditions of awareness uh, between what's outside of you um, and what's inside the building. And this uh, experience is also mirrored um, via a series of social interactions, uh, which um, occur between the different user groups in this um, very large and uh, comprehensive social um, space. Are there any questions? Uh, you talked about masonry in one wall section. Is that the, the, what am I looking at there? That's a chapel on the ground floor? Back to that section I'm showing. Well, I'm. The chapel we, is plywood. This is the chapel, but it's plywood. But on this other wall section, if the pages will turn quickly. Sorry, there's a bit of a lag in loading is, your pages. Is, is the masonry in that? core, external core looks like? Essentially, yeah, these lower volumes, except for the chapel and the stair cores are masonry. So you can see it here in section, but yeah, these gray volumes are the masonry. Well, I think this is a uh, perfect project to discuss what happens in a course like this, I think. You started with this, uh, your conceptual perspective that you got these two planes that are infinitely thin and there's these boxes inside. And I saw some models there. Uh, 
which I guess they're not going to be models in the digital world in the future. They look really interesting, and the same thing they, they reinforce this idea of the two planes. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's this is the problem with zooming. Uh, anyway, I I think that concept is is uh, you know it's interesting. It 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 just the very sight move of putting this thing on the edge where it's very different raises the question to me, well, how are the two sides of it different then? Because you've got the cemetery on one side and you've got a parking lot on the other side. And you are dealing it differently, but it raises some questions. I think the, the, uh, the main issue is I think, you know, the first image and the last image showed a connection between an idea and, and a, an execution. There's a lot of stuff in the middle, particularly the interior perspectives of the corridors where that idea just isn't there. Yeah, that one. Well, this one, any of these, see, it's there, but it's not really because everything's touching the wall. I think when you get to the upper floors where it really gets filled up with program. Yeah, like there, there's a good example. You know, uh, your your concept there is, is, is basic, everything's connected to everything else. It, it looks fine. It's just a different building, conceptually a different building. And I think your longitudinal section was in a way there wasn't anything wrong with it technically, but it was a different building because you really filled out that space. I mean, ideally, you'd have like three boxes in this thing, right? You'd have as little program as possible. So, um, and I'm not going to be the one to tell you that you got to connect the two tops of these things together, <laughs> but it is, it, that's the first, any engineer is going to tell you that these two pieces, you know, the two walls are going to, they're, it's not impossible. You're going to need some pretty beefy steel in there to make that happen. And I think it's worth it, whatever, you know, we're spending imaginary money here, but I'm drifting. You understand what I'm saying about the two walls not being connected? It's very important, yeah. actually. It's very difficult structurally. But I think what I really, uh, I mean, there's not, is this, this is a nice drawing, but I don't see your concept of boxes inside planes here. And, uh, and the polycarbonate wall, I don't know how big a piece of polycarbonate you can have. It, it's it's pretty tight mullion system. Maybe that's necessary with the material, but it seems I might investigate other glazing systems that, uh, particularly the this, we're looking at the shingled wall here. And again, I'm not really reading that. Um, so the other thing I would do is, um, I mean, that's the interesting thing about this program is is. Uh, well, the cemetery aspect of it, and and to me, the, the the chapel, you have the opportunity to put this outside the system. Maybe it should be concrete, you know. Maybe it should it should be low bearing masonry. Maybe it should really it sticks out of the building. I think that's a good start, uh, and I think I think that's a great move. Yeah, that's little section here at the lower left. Um, I may really make that different. I'd like to look at that and understand. Well, that's a really different building. That's you know that's gravitas. That's got to have monumentality, even if it's all, it's in this uh, in the swamp. And uh, to me, pulling out the what looks like more of a utility core on the outside diminishes that because it's it's not the chapel. But um, anyway, I conceptually I like this building a lot. I I and developmentally I can't. Uh, I can't find any technical uh, issues with it, except again, I say that you know, well, you, this drawing shows it well, again, the, the lateral connection between the two. But I do think you could solve these technical problems in a way that could make your initial concept read more clearly through the whole whole affair. And again, it's it, it reads well in the first drawing, it reads well in your last drawing. Mm -hmm. So is the issue essentially these catwalks being not light enough between the volumes in the screen? I think they could pull back farther. I think, you know, it, in the drawing on the extreme right here, there's just simply so much program in there, you'll, you know, you can't perceive the, the totality. Mm -hmm. So one question is, could we make the volume bigger or could we make the program smaller in some way? Uh, but I think in other places, you know, this is the drawing where it really, your idea is just simply not there. This is a, a uh, a, uh, 
a complex section, interesting complex section, but it's not a series of volumes floating inside this, between these two uh, translucent planes. You follow me? What's that? I mean, in, is that in a way, a bad thing, or is that just different than how we described it? I'm sorry. Is that necessarily a bad thing that they're not exactly floating volumes, or is that just an issue with how we described it? Well, it, it's the drawings. I, <laughs> I'm going by, but I, I mean, that's um, it, you know, like Luke Hahn said the whole issue of design is when you make things the same and when you make them different, right? And and a great designer will know when to break their own rules. And uh, and I, to me, the chapel is where you break the rules, right? Because it's different. Or maybe this big staircase is the point because that's the social space. What I see here is 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 a different concept than than the one you showed me in your first perspective and your last perspective. And uh, I don't know that I'm getting more for that 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 difference. It's also probably just where you took this section. Uh, um, but it's 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 a different building. And again, I think the perspective. It's but again, it's the cr the cross sections again. I I would just pull back from that those two polycarbonate walls wherever you could. Obviously, they need to be structured, but um, I think we just. I think it's a beautiful idea. It's very simple. You have this. Uh, two planes and boxes, and I would like to see that stronger. And then you could decide, okay, we got that established. Now we're going to put in a sphere. Or I, I don't know what we're going to do. We're going to do something that's that's outside that system. So I saw this one as well at uh, at mid review, and I liked it then. And I like a lot of what you've done with the program. You've cleaned some stuff up. At the, at the entry, and I think it's a really clear presentation that, and amplify a bit rather than add anything new where Mr. Ford was headed. You guys had a night sort of rendering type thing when we were at mid review, didn't you? Yep. And it was. Yeah, there. There was another one where it was just like the glowing gem with the little boxes hanging in there, right? A little bit more than this. And then we, we talked a bit about how the detailing of the polycarbonate was going to become difficult because the, the gantries and the system were going to take over the skin. Whereas I'm pretty sure I saw one before where it was kind of a glowing gem with these little program elements in it. It's not wrong. That one diagram you have where you break out the individual pieces of program and it, you get to the end and the interstitial space is all green. There it is, back one. There was another one, if, that guy. You know, this really is that bit at the top plus the polygal screen is supposed to be the identity of this building. So first and foremost, I want you to understand, I think this was really thoroughly done. I think you made use of renderings in a way I've not seen done in a studio before where at every turn when I didn't understand what I was looking at, you had a visual explanation like, and this is what it is. And that makes it very easy for everybody to look at it and, and judge your idea. I do think something has gotten lost from when it was abstract with respect to how building-y this thing got. Um, and that was always going to be the problem. The problem, particularly with the polygal, so when we go to those exterior images where we're looking at polycarbonate, and I, yeah, go back one, that's fine. Oh, sorry. I think I. What? <laughs> that one, that one right there. So, you know, the, the worry was, was at the end of the day, and he is right, you're gonna have to do something to hold the structure. At the end of the day, when you declare a system like this, you're limited to the size and the performance of the material. And the detailing becomes really, really, really important. And the worry at mid-review was that at the end, these were gonna end up being fins and you're gonna end up with a version basically of uh, the Jean Nouvel building in Paris at the Cartier Foundation. And that's kind of where it ended up being. So I think the, the, the biggest challenge here, and I do think this is really skillfully done, and I actually really like it, 
is how to have less apparent structure around this glass skin and more amplification of the individual hanging program elements and more dead air in between, because that's what all of this is about. Some of that has to do with, with how you've rendered it, but you know, it is my only real critique I have about this. You've got the plan figured out. I still don't completely buy the uh, sharing noise and sharing the windows opening and screwing with the guy beneath you, but that was your idea. And I love that, I love that you chased it. I'm all good with it. Um, because that's what you guys set out to do was to create a hotel I don't want to go to. That having been said, um, you know, obviously you're not going to come back to this and you're not going to mess with it. But the next time you're playing with these ideas, I think really early on it would help you. This is the kind of project that almost day one requires you to think about structural systems and detailing. Because for the idea to work, you know, it needs to end up looking like the models that Rem Kohlhaus did for the Tre Grand Librairie, where all they had were the little circulation elements. They didn't even have the program. Um, aside from that, I feel like kind of a prick to even like go after you about anything about this because it's just such a nice project. You did a nice job. And that was a ton of work from mid review mm -hmm. from your house wearing a mask. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Thank I mean, you I, I don't Thank know. You I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with a lot of the comments um, that were said before. One of the things I'd like to address um, again is the the views that you guys use, like using them strategically. It's almost like I got annoyed at the beginning because you kept saying like, and here's the entry to this. And then I saw, then you would show us the section and show us the entry. And then finally we got to the vignette, you know, I was like, oh, thank you. Perfect. I was waiting, you know, for that. So it was almost like you choreographed it. So I felt like, you know, in the end, even though I was like, where is it? I was like, oh, oh, fine. They knew that was coming all along. So I agree with that. Um, I'd like to talk about the sort of keep going into that idea about the edge of like, because I think you successfully created that edge in sight and in the landscape, you know, the building is a great edge. And then when you get into like um, the facade and that wants to be an edge as powerfully as your building is an edge on the, on the site and it doesn't quite get there like people were, you know, like we've been mentioning is that maybe the thinness or the way that it's treated, you know, in the floor plane or if the the polycarbonate system that holds it up needs to be less apparent, you know, and it needs to float more. Like, however you do that, I think is, is kind of critical. You can see it a little bit here, but again, in that hallway, you know, not so much, you know, in terms of the way that you want it to separate. And I think some of the ways that you've tried to separate it, like in the floor with the grates and stuff like that, that's a little problematic, right? Because you can't really have people walking on grates, you know, because they slip through them in particular shoes and things like that. And, and so I think that that is a little bit more of an idea than a successful implementation of the separation between the two, if that makes any sense. Like the, it's, um, so, but it's a beautiful, you know, it's a beautiful project. Um, and I do like the idea that it occupied, that the building itself is a, is a thickening of that edge and a sort of intensification of the edge between both of those. And it doesn't necessarily try to separate both of them and you can slide right along both sides. And when you're out in the cemetery, you can still see the relationship between the two, which I think is kind of, is, is an interesting thing that is a, an interesting contrast between the previous project as well, which was also linear. Um, I have one question for you guys. Um, you were talking about the movement of the polycarbonate panels. And I like, does each individual square of those move? Like, how do they, how do they move? It's just on the hotel floors. Okay. Um, and yes, they- Very slow scrolling. Um, they that's do. okay. I mean, so each one of those is like on a slider and you can just slide it. Like, yeah, there's a, there's a redundant track. There's a redundant track. Okay. Yeah. I think that one of the comments that I had written down is like, what, what are you getting out of the sort of offset both vertically um, and maybe also horizontally, like somehow playing that relationship up? Like, um, 
is it that big of a deal? I agree that, you know, you came from your original sort of um, that original drawing and really pushed it. So I think that that worked really well. But I also feel like in the end, it's kind of not as strong or as vibrant as you'd like it to be. Um, but otherwise, I mean, it's very interesting. Um, one other final comment that I would make is on your diagrams, I think those are really powerful, those ones in the beginning, and there's, they were super helpful to understand the projects, especially the interstitial space diagram. Um, I think you could use those to your advantage, both in presentation and in design process, if you use them and manipulated them in the way that you're thinking about your building. So the interstitial, um, the interstitial diagram would be much nicer if it were transparent and had some idea of like how those spaces are occupied as opposed to being solid. The exploded diagram of your structure, I feel like you do lift stuff up, but I feel like I almost want to look at it at a different angle so I can see the structure in the way that you're thinking about it, which is those slices of vertical space and the suspension of the things in between. So starting to look at like how you diagram the building um, and, and pull it apart in its pieces and actually doing that in the way that you're thinking about it as a design process. Because I think that sometimes the tools that we use, they're really facile right now. And so you can really blow things up in all sorts of different ways, you know, but to really focus on how you can use that tool to actually expand the way that you're thinking about your design. Because um, I, think, I think that, and it's a pet peeve of mine too. I get tired of people like doing these and this is a fine drawing, but you know the sometimes the displaced drawings sh do not explain as much as they do when the whole thing's together. You know, like I want you to be able to use that as a as an efficient tool. So that's all I got. Nice job. Thanks, Marla. <laughs> so well, congratulations to to your work. Uh, it's amazing work. Fantastic graphics. Uh, I would like to consider the something about the first scheme. Uh, can you show me the the for yes, yes, no, uh, the the other slide. Uh, no, uh, go 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 ahead. Uh, not not in, not behind uh, the first two scheme. Yes, the not next one. Next, yes, this this one. So uh, I was dazzled about this scheme because uh, you are suggesting me a kind of uh, building wall, uh, but it's not uh, an entire wall uh, boundary between the port and the cemetery. And the way that you uh, mix these uh, containers uh, inside the building uh, create uh, very interesting environments. But I, I'm afraid that the building, the finished building, uh, are a bit uh, are against this scheme. I you try to to explain to you uh, the regular columns uh, don't don't uh, give you the enough freedom to create the voids between the the vaults uh, between the environments. I think the the extra the extra choice could be more aggressive. Uh, for instance, uh, take the two staircases and you can put the uh, the corn in the corners and create a kind of a truss, uh, a kind of a bridge connecting these two two stairs. And uh, after that, uh, you can hang the containers, the environments, using risers. And uh, you can maybe, you could uh, follow be uh, better the, this scheme, extrutural scheme. I don't know if, if I, I was clear, but uh, it's something that uh, you could uh, consider. 
but uh, maybe uh, disconnecting the church uh, put uh, uh, out of the building, you can um, you can have an opportunity to make it lighter. But uh, I think uh, it will be better better if you are considering to change this metallic structure, maybe in uh, creating a a huge bridge and trying to hang the the these containers and environments using risers for instance but despite that uh, it was uh, an amazing work it's so easy uh, again it's so easy to mean to judge something uh, difficult to be understand uh, and to to be realized, both, but it's a it's a suggestion. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'm I'm sorry I missed the uh, earlier reviews because I, I mean, it's an interesting, it's just a fascinating site, and and you could say. Well, why put the building here at all? I mean, if, if you don't want to, <laughs> if you're going to hide, you don't want to look at the cemetery, maybe the building should go in the parking lot or someplace like that. So, I mean, there's a strange, um, in landscape architecture, particularly 18th century and landscape architecture is a concept of, they called it pleasurable melancholy. And it means you enjoy cemeteries. And uh, it's it, little cemeteries are, are strangely evocative and romantic. Big cemeteries are just depressing as hell. And it's something we all feel. I just wonder if, you know, I don't think it's unrelated to technology, but this seems like it's a site. I mean, why is this thing even here? Why didn't they tear it down, you know, long ago and build some more parking? It's because it's it's somehow consecrated or or sacred. So, regardless of how run down it is, there's a reason for it to be there. And I'm not sure how you would do it, but I. I'd, I'd like, and I think you, maybe your chapel in this scheme is starting to, but how you would engage that in an experiential way and say, well, it's actually, it's not, it's not beautiful in the sense that a postcard is beautiful, but it's, it's, it's evocative in some way. And that you would have experiencing this building would include the experience of the two very different landscapes that you're, you're, you're looking at. And I think both schemes did that. I, I, I think it, it's just that it challenges a lot of our preconceptions. The site challenges a lot of preconceptions about what, what you want to see when you look out a window and, and what's interesting and what's not. Yeah, it's, this has been a fascinating discussion because I think, you know, all these questions about exposing the steel frame, like your, you know, all of your conceptual thinking is kind of about suppression. Like the polygal, I think was about kind of blurring everything, um, uh, you know, making the building less, a little bit less explicit. Um, and the frame in its exposed condition, you know, an exposed frame is explicit by definition. It just has to be. So, you know, whether you take Giovanni's suggestion or Ed was suggested, I think something a little different and you essentially find ways of making those thin walls thinner. That's one way to go, like actually get to the intention. The other is actually change the intention a little bit. Like I can imagine a version of your building where that cemetery side wall is like some great deep Corbusian, um, you know, Brice Soleil, which has variability in it. And you could argue that just as easily. It'd be a different argument, of course, um, but, uh, 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 you know, at some point, I think in, in these in projects, like there's this decision point where you're kind of like, okay, well, this is what it's going to take to really do what I'm saying I'm going to do. Is it like, is that, is that really still what I want when I realize what it is I'm going to have to do to make that happen? Or do I actually have to change my intentions a little bit? Again, like a lot of things we said, no, no right answer, but I think some, some of the points today have been about that, uh, the friction between all that structure, which you probably need more of, as Ed pointed out, to actually hold the thing up, and and, and the the, the ideal of having this building be um, sort of abstract, which is uh, 
hard to make structure abstract, <laughs> exposed structure. Well, the, uh, the Cartier building that was mentioned actually has a beautiful, uh, it's just a big steel hand that goes out and grabs the end of the, of the glass because it, it's just waving out there in the breeze. And it's quite beautiful. I mean, it really makes the building in a way, it's, it's a kind of high tech, very expensive band-aid, but it, it, it's a one, that's a, what I mean by an exception to the concept. Mm -hmm. to a, I love that. It's like the, 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 the umbilical that the Dulles airport has to get the, yeah. I don't know why, I guess the roof drains down. Yeah, it's exactly. like, like at some point in that process, they're like, crap, what are we gonna do with the water? And you know, there's this invention of something that's totally foreign to the system that is just put in there anyway. Um, well, a last thought, and this is, this is the basic Corbusian way of detailing. And he, we're usually working in concrete. If you can't make it go away, make it gigantic, you know, just like the, the gutters at Ronchap, you just make it as big and heavy and, and apparent as possible rather than trying to hide it and, and uh, make it way too small so it doesn't work anymore. So if you can't make it invisible, make it big. I'm going to use that. I like that. <laughs> I'm totally going there. We can't make it go away, but now it's really conspicuous. Um, okay. Well, I think maybe we should close there. Burton, I'm sorry. I thought I gotten one of each, um, but I didn't. I, that, that's my uh, that's my mistake. It was uh, nice to get the closure. It was nice to see them both. It was cool. <laughs> um, Ed, thank you so much. Giovanni, I know you're joining us for the next session as well. Um, and Marla, thank you. I really appreciate the time and attention. It was a pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys so much. Nice job, guys. All right. All right. Uh, so everyone will be back at three o'clock for the last two of the day. Okay. And Giovanni, you're coming back, right? Or you can yes. stay here. Yeah. Yes, yeah. in a few minutes, I'll be there. Hey, Murray. Hi, how are you, Giovanni? Hello. Daniel, hey, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, I, think, uh, I think we're just waiting on Mel Lawrence then. Okay. Um, so let's give him a minute or two, and if he doesn't get here, we'll, we'll start without him. How's it going? Well, I'm yeah, probably not the one to answer that. That's <laughs> Long day. Uh, yeah, I know it's been, today's been great because I, you know, like all the organization is now done. Um, not that I do most of it. Tommy has done the bulk of it, but uh, uh, it's um, it's more doing it online than right. doing it in person for sure. Right. Well, I thought um, I was on a vertical yesterday and I thought it went very well. Yeah. 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 I think the response has been good. Um, you know, I'm sure we'll, yeah. we'll hear about the other the negative side of it at some point. Right. Daniel, have, have you already done your studio? Hmm? Wait, what, what day is your studio review? Uh, it's tomorrow morning. Tomorrow, okay. Yeah. Uh, but, but the live stream is really super. Like it's, yeah. It's great, like, um, you know, when it's physical, you can a bit like look through, look at the posters and so on. But unfortunately, you never can keep them up. And so, so right. you just like, a uh, very short snapshot of two or three works per studio, but now like the video allows you also later, you can like really scroll through, like you can nicely like get really like- uh, Yep, really yep. That is really good. Hey Mel. Hey, how are you doing? Thank you for joining. I enjoyed enjoyed the stuff for your studio yesterday. Oh, good. Um, so yeah. um, we had, this is a, this this is an integrative studio, uh, so it's they worked in pairs. So we don't we only have two projects uh, to do. Uh, they've been running about forty five minutes a piece in the in the first two sessions, and so that's our a rough target. But uh, you know we can go shorter or longer as you all desire. Um, the uh, I have a, I have about twelve slide introduction. Um, Giovanni was on the last uh, session as well, so Giovanni, you're just going to have to listen listen to me yes. again. But uh, I'll do a I'll do a you know eight to ten minute intro and then turn it over to the first project. Um, okay, let's see. Okay.
You all seen that? Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to flip past this slide because it, it mesmerizes me and I can't talk while it's going. But um, the uh, the studio is called Boundary Effects, and and the real issue of the studio was um, uh, looking at edge conditions. And uh, the primary argument is that a boundary between two things is never just a line. I mean, even if it is literally a line, like it's a political boundary or a property line, it always generates. Uh, uh, territory of either activity or physical change, which is a zone rather than a, a line or a plane. And, uh, and the, the way I kind of just describe the premise is, you know, as soon as you think about that as a spatial condition, it's one of the things that architecture is, is built to condition, right? So there's uh, the studio, the, the problem was basically designed to try and foreground this question of edges or boundaries, um, uh, both kind of external conditions to the project, like site circumstances, but also internal conditions, um, which impacted the program a lot. So the, uh, the, the site is, um, is where this orange circle is. It's in Morgan's Point, which is right along the Houston Shipping Channel. Uh, to the south of this, uh, this location is Galveston Bay and the, the Gulf of Mexico. If you follow the shipping channel up and to the left, you'll eventually get to Houston. Um, but this peninsula, Morgan's Point, is a, was a settlement. It was a town um, uh, originally. Uh, but it has on the north side of that peninsula, it has a, um, well, it was once basically a, a, a wharf and is now a container, a container port. Um, it's called Barber's Cut. And uh, this is sort of the situation. So Houston shipping channel is to the right. Um, uh, this cut, which was once a creek, has been dredged and is a uh, you know where the container ships come in and turn around and leave. And this edge is essentially a big container unloading edge. Um, and you know, containerized shipping really came into being in the '60s and has you know all almost all ship uh, traffic now is uh, is containerized shipping. So it's grown tremendously. And what's happened is this the port itself, which is basically a gigantic flat pavement of concrete has expanded over the past decades more and more. And what was once a, a community that occupied the entire sort of end of this peninsula um, was slowly engulfed and taken over by the port as it expanded. Uh, the one piece of that community that, that I guess for cultural reasons couldn't be taken over was this cemetery. This, um, it's about a 300 foot square, which was uh, a cemetery that was uh, founded about a century ago. It occupied the kind of top of a very gentle hill. Um, and as the port pavement expanded, which needed to be more or less level, uh, the, there is an edge condition developed where uh, the port surface is about six feet below the ground level of the cemetery um, because the hill basically was excavated away. The other interesting thing about the site is there is a kind of no man's land between the cemetery itself and the port fence, which is a security fence. It's a big chain link fence with razor wire on top. And that, that band of space, which looks like trees, uh, you can go forward, you can kind of see it here on the lower image, is essentially volunteer vegetation that has grown up over the years. And so there are some really nice big trees in the cemetery. You can see them in that upper photograph. Um, but the perimeter vegetation is really scrub, uh, some of which has grown quite large. Um, but it exists sort of on a tumble down topography where the cemetery ends before you get to the fence. It's just sort of um, leftover space. And that essentially is the site of the, of the project. You know, the ground surface of the port is heavily used and needed. The ground surface of the cemetery is graves, right? So that can't really be practically built upon. And so uh, the students were basically forced to occupy the scene between the cemetery and the port in some way. You'll see different solutions. You know, some teams occupied more of the edge, other teams concentrated the program in one edge or one corner. Uh, but, uh, but that essentially was the available territory that they could build on. Um, in, in this lower aerial photo, you can see to the right here is that was once the original driveway access to the cemetery. And about six years ago, um, the port paid to have a new driveway put in and a new parking lot. And it was 
in an effort to capture this little wedge of space uh, and make it contiguous with the port. Um, but I, the students were free to re-renovate, re reconceptualize this entire front area in front of the cemetery if they chose to. Um, so this top image, like at, at one, at one, at first glance, it's a, a sort of classic small scale American cemetery that seems quite bucolic and it is, but you can see kind of behind this, these, this tree line in the back, uh, these huge cranes and, uh, and these, these are post Panamax scale cranes. You can get a sense, this is a switchback stair like up here. So you can get a sense of how huge these things are. And they're lit up at night and they're always moving containers and they, they slide up and down the edge of the water uh, to, to get to where the ships are and unload the containers. But completely surrounding the, the cemetery is all sorts of activity. There's uh, tractor trailers driving through, there's uh, uh, other cranes that are on wheels that are quite high because they can, they can slide over stacks of uh, five, five high container stacks. Um, and there's all sorts of acoustic intrusion as well. Like uh, there's noise from the machines backing up, there's engine noises and things like that. Uh, so it is in many ways a very surreal environment. Also, they run the they run three shifts at the container port, so um, it's never really dark in the cemetery. They have these really tall, ma high mast uh, lights to, to light up the container yard, which are like the ones you see at the uh, cloverleaf interchanges and big highways. And so they light up the cemetery at night as well. So it's um, it's a kind of peculiar place, um, but uh, but I think interesting from the way I was framing the studio in the sense that the edge really conditions the experience uh, on the port to some degree, but certainly in the cemetery. You can see in this left-hand picture, this is the new parking lot and this fence in, at the front of the cemetery. And it gives you a sense of that five to six foot elevation change. That parking lot is roughly at the grade of the port um, uh, pavement. And uh, like much of around Houston, it's basically all clay soil. So although it's elevated, it doesn't very drain very well. And uh, some, some projects have made that kind of improving the drainage uh, uh, condition of their uh, diagram diagrammatic response. Um, I had to put this in here because the students built a group site model and they didn't get to use it. So I don't think you're going to see many images of this. But uh, uh, this is a transect from this road. Uh, which is primarily tractor trailer traffic. This is essentially a boulevard for the hundreds of tractor trailers that come in uh, to pick up containers. They generally drive by the cemetery, go into the port and move through and get loaded with their containers and then leave again on, on this side. So that's, that's more or less the site. Um, the program, uh, as I mentioned, is, is also intended to try and foreground this issue of boundary. So it's a multi-use program with the intent of uh, of having different users and different uses within the project. So there are some internal boundary conditions between those different uses, uses and users. So it's basically three parts. There's a, for the uh, cemetery visitors or those who might be attending a burial ceremony, um, there is a meeting hall or chapel that could accommodate the ceremony itself, a small one, as well as a few offices and a, basically a garage so they can have a place to put the lawnmower and things like that. Uh, for the port stevedores, the stevedores are basically the, the workers who are out in the yard of the port, uh, mostly driving equipment, you know, moving containers around, things like that. Uh, there, is a, um, there is a port administrative function, which is sort of desk work, working on computers, but also facilities for the workers themselves, a break room, a place to use the bathroom, lockers, um, a place to eat lunch, that sort of thing. And so that's the second, uh, the second program. And the third program is essentially a, a small hotel. Um, the truckers, this, is a, this image is of a gas station, which is just west of the site. Um, and it's the Exxon station, but it has a second floor on top of the convenience store, which is basically a 22 room hotel. Um, and it serves uh, nearly exclusively the trucking community. They come in and either drop off or pick up containers uh, uh, but generally speaking, they, if they're traveling from far, they may need to stay overnight. They also tend to stay in a hotel on nights when they need to catch up on their laundry and things like that. Uh, but generally speaking, when they're staying in the hotel, they, they don't have a load. So it's usually they need a parking space for their, uh, for their tractors, but it's not a, 
It's not an entire tractor trailer parking space. Um, so, so we asked for overnight accommodations for truckers um, and some associated programs like a laundry facility, a social area. Um, some people have put in a small market or other, other ancillary services that might serve that, that, um, those overnight staying truckers. Um, and then one, one of the things we learned too in our early research was uh, the ship crews, you know, the crews who come in on these ships, uh, nowadays with containerized shipping, they unload these ships so quickly. Usually the ships are unloaded in 18, their turnaround time is 18 to 24 hours. Uh, so while it used to be when ships docked in a place, they, the ship's crews would all go into town and participate in the you know, economic and social life of the town, that no longer happens. In fact, there's actually a facility in this yard now, which is like a little overnight stay for the ship's crews. And so we, we, we uh, different teams have taken different attitudes, but the hotel could be for truckers, it could be for the ship's crews, or it could be for a combination. But it makes a, a difference because the truckers are generally accessing the hotel from the outside the security perimeter of the port, whereas the ship's crews are accessing it from the inside. So I can't remember in these two projects if they're different, but that was one thing that, that, that we turned up in our research. I'm not gonna go over this. This is basically the detailed program that the, the, the group put together for each of these functions, but you can see here the meeting hall chapel is the assembly space. The lodging is uh, you know, overnight residential space and the port services, essentially a business occupancy. Um, by the time you add circulation and services, it's, uh, there's considerable range, but basically it's a total gross square footage of somewhere between 22,000 and 47,000 square feet. Uh, um, so that's the program. And then just a, quick, a few quick words about the process. Um, we did do a sort of two week research phase at the beginning, um, but then we did uh, in a group site model, but we did two one week exercises um, these are not from this studio, but the first was called a ligature transect study. And a ligature is, um, you know, like when you have two letters glued together, an A and an E. And the idea was to kind of take, uh, have the students um, make an, a, a, a sample of an architectural condition that bridge between port and cemetery, uh, but also bridge between two internal programs. So it was intended before they got into the complexities of like planning the project, like what program goes where and where the entrances are, just to kind of take a stab at a potential spatial condition or architectural device or even material condition that um, they were interested in. That was a little one week project and they were asked to do a, a sectional study model basically. Um, and then the second one week exercise, I called affect, con affect constitution. I've done this one before, but they were asked, each, each group was asked to do two drawings, um, one which was about experience. Um, and it could be the, you know, the perception of the building from the outside or the experience of an interior space. And pair that with a second drawing, which was about the constitutional character of the building. So that might address possible materials, possible um, uh, structural conditions, basically a, a effort to have them bookmark some idea about what the building might be made of or how it might be made uh, before they got too far into the diagramming of the, of the spatial solution. Um, so with that, um, you know, that was about five weeks in, uh, they were kind of cut, cut loose to really free to design the project, which has been the last 10 weeks. Um, so that, that's, that's a, in, in very quick terms, that's a description of how the project was framed. Um, again, all about these kind of boundary conditions and how they might be conditioned by architecture. And I'll stop there. I don't know if, uh, if anyone has any questions. If not, I, I can launch the first group. A uh, quick question. Where did, how did yeah. you find this site? That's an amazing site. Yeah, isn't it great? I've used it once before. I, I happened upon it. You know, when I, I, I came here from North Carolina like 10 years ago, 11 years ago now, and I kind of used studio sites to explore Texas and everyone wow. back then, like I did a bunch with Russell Kreppart and he was super into West Texas. And so when he left, I decided maybe I need to try look around the East. <laughs> yeah. And I just randomly happened upon it. Can you, but yeah. Can, is a, is a cemetery like open to the public? Can you just drive up there? And yeah, it's open to the public. Yeah. It's, um, oh. and it's still active. It's not nearly full. You know, there's some very old graves, but there's some very recent ones too. And there's evidence, oh, wow. you know, it's pretty, 
desolate. Not a lot of people are actively using it, but there are, uh, you know, there's flowers on some of the graves and things like that. So, did, did you find it from looking at aerial maps for interesting? Yeah, places? yeah, okay. yeah. I was looking around, find, looking for weird things, and I basically found it. And went to went to visit it. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. It's a remarkable site, especially the yeah, it, 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 yeah. proximity. My God. Yeah, it's pretty. It is a pretty. It's a strange place, but um, you know, I like that. Um, uh, okay, so we have two groups. Um, Jenny and Annie is the is the first pair. Um, so I think I'll let them take over. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay. Hey everyone, can you see my screen? Okay. Awesome. Yes. Yes. Um, okay, I'm Annie Jenkins, and this is my partner. Hey, I'm Jenny. <laughs> um, so for us, our narrative um, really began with our site visit. So um, as Cisco explained, um, this is a cemetery located in a very active, still functioning port. Um, and we were really struck by these moments, uh, which reveals actually part of the drainage failure that's going on at our site, but we were inspired by this reflective nature of these puddles um, and the boundary that sort of is blurred between ground and sky um, and even the awareness of the sky from these puddles. And uh, we immediately had an interest in verticality. And we also noticed just with the active nature of the surrounding site that we really wanted to protect from all of this light going on at night, especially with the program of a hotel and, um, you know, the views are not particularly nice outward. So we immediately had the intentionality of focusing those views upward um, to the sky. So you'll really see that just as a continuation throughout the project. And early on um, with this construct drawing, we already were experimenting with the parameter of having that verticality occur over things like circulation. Um, and even emphasis on the horizon and the blurring of that line with these um, punched out openings that actually host um, public space and public gathering, as you see here on the left. Yeah, so after studying the existing conditions, we really identified the northern edge of the port where the cranes are located as the um, main source of disruption and noise. And so we wanted to locate our building along that northern edge of the site, where it really acts as a mediator between the port and the cemetery. And so for the site, there's two primary ways of accessing. The first is from the north directly off of the port, which is primarily for port um, administration or ship crews. And then the second is from the south, which would be primarily for people visiting the cemetery in which they would come and park and then proceed up this long pathway um, through these grassy fields to get to the building. So um, based off of those original intentions, we very quickly created these parameters that really guided our logic throughout the project. So um, one of which is curated views, as we talked about this idea of verticality and really breaking up our horizontal planes to have this continued awareness of the sky and its relationship to the ground. Um, and then we also started using, so this is up here, the cemetery area just for orientation. And this on, um, diagonally is actually the port orientation. So we quickly decided that we just wanted apertures on the Eastern and Western facades, which you'll see in more detail in our plans. And um, that was to create a privacy for the cemetery. So you never have people um, watching someone who might be coming to reflect and things like that, as well as creating this idea of intimacy. And then we also were really playing with um, a playful gesture in circulation. So um, we're very intentional about who can access what um, and using this truly as a mediator between these two programs. Um, and we also were thinking about, you know, we're playing off of this stacking nature. So even though um, this, our material really sets us apart from the surrounding port, we are playing off of these um, stacked uh, vernacular, so to speak, of the port function um, in order to create views horizontally um, to public space as a means of wayfinding. And then we're also using a reflective stone, um, which you'll see in our renderings on the interior parts of these cutouts um, as a way to play off of that reflective nature. Um, and you'll also see that um, we have a rule break, which is our chapel. So we'll expand on that. But these were our initial parameters 
um, that we are sort of working off of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so looking a little bit more at the site, um, we're going to be reworking and essentially building up the existing topography of the cemetery and creating kind of this grassy field. So if you can look at the top plan uh, on the right side, the left side is going to be a consistent kind of more formal incline versus the right side is more of this like organic, natural grassy field. And basically what this does is by building up the topography, it essentially allows us to hide the lowest level of our building, giving it a lower profile and making it less obtrusive to the people that are visiting the cemetery. And in the site section at the bottom, you can start, oh, sorry, <laughs> at the site section in the bottom, you can start to see some of the main aspects of the project, like our building is three floors. We have kind of this protruding occupiable um, walkway, which we're calling the brow. And we have a series of courtyards and stairs that are open to the sky. Yeah. In this view of the cemetery, you start to see those overall site and formal strategies, which we've employed throughout the project. Okay, so diving into the floor plans a little bit more, this is our ground level or the brow floor plan. And this space is um, a mixture of programs serving both the cemetery, such as the chapel, and also geared more for support workers, such as a break room. And you can see that this occupiable brow really organizes all of these individual volumes, and it also creates outdoor spaces for gathering and circulation. And additionally, like Annie said, the chapel is the only space which breaks this boundary and that signifies its importance and its sacredness. Then moving on to the lower level. Um, so this is the primary entry level of the building. So you can enter from the north in two, three main nodes which provide vertical circulation, or you can also filter through some exterior corridors into secondary spaces. Alternatively, if you enter from the south, you'll walk past the columbarium into the chapel lobby. And the reason that we have a columbarium is we are moving away from burials and graves towards an urn or columbarium system. Yeah, so this is that approach that Jenny was talking about to the columbarium. Um, and I think this is a really uh, good contrast to um, the surrounding port and even a means between the limestone, which you're, we're almost blurring that boundary between what is wall versus ground um, and then versus the natural. So I think this view really showcases that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is um, our last upper floor plan. So this is where all of the hotel rooms for the ship's crew are located. So we have four main typologies, which have one, two or four bedrooms, depending on what the user needs. And you can see that each unit is accessed from an exposed exterior stair, which creates a vertical moment, again, like really emphasizing verticality and drawing your eyes up to the sky. Yeah, and this is actually one of our upper floor typologies. Um, so one of the moments we really wanted from the beginning was um, this promenade up the stair, and then you get glimpses of the sky and really accentuating that verticality that we established from the beginning. Um, and this is our roof plan. So um, sort of showing our strategy um, and having these pieces that are all on these individual systems, um, at least as far as drainage is concerned. And then um, for our sections, so we really are Again, playing with this idea of intentional viewfinding um, as well as wayfinding in general. So um, we're strategizing sectionally. Um, with, you'll see some double height bathrooms. We actually tried to really celebrate those uh, programs that are typically more odd or almost um, left to the wayside as a means of creating um, this more interesting means of placemaking. Um, and you almost happen upon these really nice spaces. This is our chapel yeah. view. Yeah, so here you can start to see a little bit of this sectional relationship between the chapel and that double height lobby space below. And you can even get a little peek of the columbarium outside. Yeah, and kind of similarly, um, you can also see that reflective band that we were talking about that happens um, in the negative space of uh, where we've got the almost plaza-like areas. Um, and you'll also notice this is one of the double height spaces actually here on the left. And it's kind of an interesting concept that you'll walk by and not see a floor or occupancy happening at that level because it's a double height space. So we're seeing that communication 
happening um, and this means of sort of meandering through um, already in that mm -hmm. material change. Yeah, and if you saw in that last section, this is an example of one of the courtyards and these not only le uh, let light down into the lower levels, but they're also an opportunity for greenery, which people can really enjoy and spend some time outside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as Amy kind of mentioned earlier, our north and south elevations don't have any openings or windows, and this is to protect from the light and noise of the port and also to give privacy um, to the cemetery. But you can see that there's one exception again, which is a large pivoting door on the end of the chapel, which can open up to the landscape. Then in contrast, our east and west facades, you can start to see how those apertures manifest. And these views also really highlight these cemetery walls, which reach out into the landscape and act as security for the port. So our building is a relatively minimal material palette of limestone, steel, and glass, but we wanted to treat the limestone differently for each face. So on the cemetery side, we'll be using rough limestone. On the port side, it would be smooth. And as Annie has mentioned, those interstitial spaces will be highly polished. And this was really an effort to relate to and embrace these different characters of the surrounding environment. And kind of similarly in how that translates to our structure, um, as you can see, um, I think the tendency is to take a very clean material and hide your structure. And we really wanted to celebrate um, a stereotomic as well. And so we actually left um, the underbelly of those structures not only exposed, but also in this color. Um, and we also really wanted to make this clean marriage of limestone and heaviness with um, steel capping. So just detailing was really important to us in this project. Um, and even with things like stone mullions and um, unconventional construction uh, documentation. So zooming a little more, this is a detailed look at one of our hotel rooms. And the goal for our rooms is that we wanted them each to be unique yet efficient. And this view also starts to show some of the commonalities between the four different typologies, such as a floating object or volume, which kind of defines space. There's also um, the curation of views and the placement of the apertures. And then finally, um, really making sure that every object and piece of furniture was multifunctional. Yeah, and kind of going off of that um, and also our detailing comment, um, this is just a little bit of those details and um, showing how we're handling some portions that are actually skylights, um, but are maybe open to the outside versus skylights. Um, that are closed off and had to be insulated. Um, I highly recommend going through our full set, set, which I believe you guys have access to, to kind of see where these um, are incorporated. But for the sake of time, um, you can also see our transition even mechanically, which follows um, our spatial concept of having this almost mechanical anchor and network on the bottom. And then that slowly turns into a mini split system. and. A decentralized system as we work upwards um, here on the right. And then um, I think, like we said with our detailing comment, um, I just wanted to sort of zoom out and we really wanted to accentuate in conclusion um, this almost cleanliness and um, I think blend into the site while also um, creating this juxtaposition of um, shapes to denote wayfinding um, and also just having everything be very intentional. Um, so I think the site plan as all the way down to our details really show this intentionality of that. Um, but otherwise, I believe that's all. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Any questions? Can, can you all um, just explain a little bit um, like the difference, I, I think I caught what you were saying, but like, what what is this versus, this is a kind of filled, the cemetery's filled, right? And then, yeah. and then what's, could you just explain that a little bit? Yeah, so um, again, we're kind of reworking the topography of the site because as you can see, it already kind of has some drainage issues. And originally we had them both as the same, but we thought that since we already have this volume that's kind of splitting the landscape, that we should 
treat these two um, spaces differently. So the left becomes kind of this more formal grand promenade versus the right side is um, kind of nestled within the columbarium and the chapel. So we wanted it to have a more intimate and kind of more casual feel to it. But they're both planted with grasses, essentially. Are they both filled to like, so am I getting this right? You're actually like, you're actually like filling the cemetery? You're, yeah, you're so we're it? building it up a little bit. Annie, do you think you could go to the site section? Yeah, so we kind of have um, a before and after view of these. So yeah, the top you can see um, the existing topography. So on the right, we're actually trying to impact it as little right. as possible, okay. but then the left is an infill situation. Okay. Mm -hmm. And is, I'm sorry, is the gradation actually um, just a conceptual gradation through the elevation change, or is there actually some kind of like um, retaining wall system or something that's marking that in the landscape? I think we were picturing it as more of um, a consistent slope. So not necessarily having retaining walls, but right, just okay. an incline. I thought I saw something like in the plan that was, okay, mm. that's cool. All right. there, there were some mm. large trees in, in that site, do they do they get taken out? Um, I think, I mean, I, I think some of them would have to be removed, or hopefully they could be relocated. And, and I definitely think we would want to avoid taking down any mature trees. But um, how, how much does it fill on the other side? <clears throat> what Sorry. was that? Sorry. How 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 much fill did you put? I mean, how what's the grade change? Um, the grade actually moves up about two and a half feet. Um, oh, so it's already sloping. Mm -hmm. It is. In that direction. Mm -hmm. So you just it's, added a, well, how much did you add to it? I, it's hard to tell in the site plan. Yeah, we oh. essentially just smoothed it out more and we actually lowered it about two feet. So um, that's now the grade change, but previously, at least on oh. the site itself, there's only about a six inch grade change once you get up from the parking okay. lot. Okay. So, um, so, it, it so your intent, I, I was just wondering about the intentions because there was a, there's a, um, I was looking through the file. There's a rendering that shows the court, but there aren't any trees in it. The one that's near the end, mm -hmm. it's the first rendering you have. And then uh, that one. So then when the grade change, I, that's why I was, it looks like you intended to take out all the trees. Mm -hmm. So I was, is that, a, but I don't know. I'm just asking the question. Yeah, I think ideally we would like to save as many as possible, but I think we previously had had some comments about, you know, like how that wouldn't be realistic or like a possibility. Um, so we're not showing them here, but I think if we could keep a lot of the trees, that would be really nice. Um, but I guess also a little bit of not having the trees in that one part was again trying to emphasize the difference between the two sides. So, but we're open. We're open to trees. We're pro yeah. trees. <laughs> well, the one, you know, I, the buildings are really uh, they look beautiful. You know, as 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 buildings. You know, and I was looking at all the detailing, and um, but I, the thing that came up for me was the question I had was about the climate there. I grew up there, not on the cemetery plot, but you know, in the Houston area. And, um, it rains all the time, but it's 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 really hot and humid, mm -hmm. and uh, shade is like everything for survival most of the year. Yeah, and to take the trees out, even the perimeter trees mm -hmm. don't look like they stay they stayed, uh, and then the buildings don't have any, like for the openings. Um, you know, I like the idea of looking up, you know, the skies are beautiful and stuff, but it's like there's a solar. I just wondered in general your attitude about the openings and how you stage them because there wasn't really a lot of shading mm -hmm. for um, what would be required climatically. And then with the, tr the trees are great because they're like a big umbrella, right? Mm -hmm. And if they're deciduous, they, they're good in the winter because they let the light through. Um, yeah, that's so a... Was, Good question. We, um, even though it's not quite as humid, um, we actually took the precedent of um, the Mediterranean coast in Spain and the vernacular there 
of um, a very bright material, as well as skylights and terracing. Um, and really this moment, it's very specific, but you see a lot of interior moments where you will be tucked into the shade um, in the interior, and then you can see um, light that's actually punching through maybe in your background. Um, I believe that moment happens in the chapel. Um, but I think for us, yes, here. So you see this moment or a pocket of light poking through in the back. Um, but otherwise, you know, we keep the windows very low, things like that, to where okay. um, using the light almost um, to make our building as a canvas and something that is very interesting with the plain mm -hmm. um, material. But right. um, that was absolutely a concern for us. And we had the terracing to still allow light in, but um, we really are controlling our apertures. Um, we also, you know, we don't have any aperture is not only for privacy, but also for solar shading on the south facade. They're only on east and west. So that was absolutely a concern for us and um, was a big push to keep all of the mature trees and also incorporate trees into the courtyard system. Um, but I think we also didn't want any sort of um, inhibitor to the sky and that view to the sky as well. Um, so we used very small um, or petite trees uh, for that reason. Okay, well, I'll just say that in the uh, in the hierarchy of if Maslow had done a hierarchy of of uh, shading priorities or climate priorities, it, <laughs> you'd probably choose like energy saving, comfort creating, broad shade at the expense of losing vertical views. You know, mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that's in, in practicing making decisions about what's most important. If you were living there on that plot of land, you probably wouldn't take you long to change your mind about what was the priority. Because <laughs> I don't think people are going to spend a lot of time standing underneath the skylight looking up, but they will spend a lot of time being in that climate, you know, mm -hmm. and, 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 and having to deal with it, whether it's, you can always condition heat and air condition inside, but it's an energy issue um, and a sustainability issue, you know, but the, this that, this is just a priority question, but I love this rendering. And I remember when I went through the file earlier today, I was thinking, well, I wish there were some more um, like this, because this is telling, and it and it and it speaks to the thoughtfulness of what you guys have um, put into this. You know, and the issue with the trees, um, it's important to show in the renderings what your intentions are. Mm -hmm. it's, it's never fair to us to say, well, I meant to have a bunch of trees there because it just looks like there's no trees, you know, so yeah. put it, put in what, and don't be afraid of them obscuring the buildings. There's ways to, okay. like, to imply them without, yeah. or just speak to the, the nature of that. I don't want to beat a dead horse, but it's, <laughs> um, um, that's, it's interesting to change the topography, but I, I'll let other people speak. I'm rambling on. I'll speak again. It's, it's interesting that you mentioned the, the vernacular of the Mediterranean as a like the interest in, in the, the choice of the material. It's also when you think about um, why actually you you use the uh, sandstone or like, like historically, then it's also it's very much relates to environmental conditions actually because you use it as a thermal mass for not storing or like absorbing the heat and releasing it over the, the night and i think i mean when you when you think further uh your you have inherent in your project i think um some moments where you could in a way use also more uh, maybe like more thicker walls or uh, the question like, for example, with, with looking up to the sky or integrating this as a motive is, uh, so, is beautiful. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's uh, raised and of course like some questions, but for example, when you show this rendering and there's an orchestration actually of, of this kind of like guiding the light, no? like, but this works also for limiting in a way the, the gap where actually you get much more light over like when you guide it along the wall. You just like look at the work from Zizat this exactly mm -hmm. this trick, you know, what he does all the time. Um, 
when you look to the to the urban plan, how you understand it from urban, I, I think there's like really like great strength of a project. And there's I think no coincidence that you end actually with a with a side plan, your presentation. It's very nice how you have in a way, I mean, from the rotation of the graveyard, you get in a way a kind of misfit of the of the kind of post-human machine of the of the container shipyard. And in a way, like you're building materialized in a way, this kind of like going back and forth, no, like this, this kind of gap zones. And uh, also you translate them then transverse you know, over the flip of orientation, how now this goes to, to this like difference and in, in permeability uh, between these gaps. So I, I'm wondering like, could, uh, could you like, when you think this even further, I'm always like on the speculative side and um, like at first, like using it more theoretically, like like that not only the cathedral has a small gap, which maybe creates more shadows, but maybe also the interior walls, because like it could be also nice when you think someone comes from a sea where you have like this endless horizons and you create exactly the, the, the opposition to that as a, mm -hmm. as a hotel room. No? Um, and, and then also, I mean, what works beautiful is actually when you stretch it out in the length for like using linearity into the graveyard, uh, there comes now my question a bit, um, what I didn't understand, what I think cannot be a potential for the project. You said there's also an entrance from the shipyard. Mm -hmm. So I think like when there anyhow exists this kind of misfits, how actually this border in a way also and it projects potentiality into this kind of void. No? How you not only have that, uh, could you also extend this kind of like, kind of heartbeat or this kind of like stretching the line? Could I even, okay, it's not part of the site original, but could that even like project it into potential for actually what's anyhow not used or not usable in any way. And I think that's like, uh, it's, uh, it's giving me a lot of ideas like uh, how you could even further like or think even an extension if that maybe would be successful how it could like no? uh, think even more like uh, extend that project or so yeah but it's, it's really nice work like very carefully um, uh, drafted yeah it's very cool thank you um can you all just quickly flip back to your site plan there I guess just to start, there's a couple of things I find like really kind of intriguing. I mean, first, the site uh, itself is so kind of like interesting and rich. Um, there's a lot there, I think, to work from that is, that, is, that is super interesting. I mean, it's one of those like site plans. As soon as I saw it, I was like, wow, this is, this is amazing. Um, the um, I guess one thing I would I, there's a couple of things that I think are like conceptually like quite interesting. Uh, about the, the basic, um, you know, kind of design approach, site plan approach. Um, I mean, I'm partial to like the, how, how restrained you are, like the simplicity of placing the, um, just, just tackling like the one boundary condition um, there along the edge and dealing with one edge. I think it was smart to deal with the east-west condition, long and east-west condition, being able to kind of play with that, uh, really controlled light and, and having the apertures like uh, inside and the east-west, like usually in the long north east-west, east, west, we have apertures on the north and south. So it's kind of like, I like that inversion of flipping that strategy and then having the interior slices with windows, I think is really interesting and smart. Um, there's so much to do in, in integrative studio. I would have loved to seen like a little bit more like experimentation with the quality of light. Um, it, the renders are like a little flat, like, like I think it could have been intriguing to see the reflectivity of the sky and those shiny interior walls, the bounce of light as, as a kind of apparatus, like modeling it physically. I know you're not, you know, you all didn't have like access to a lot of physical model stuff, but I mean, even, even like the, the digital renderings now are able to kind of render this thing, just exploring that a little bit. Um, there are two things site plan wise that I think are kind of interesting. One is this um, connection to, like I read this as like, like I actually like the kind of overgrown thicket boundary that, that it, like there's this kind of abandonment 
quality, there's a quality of abandonment to it, a kind of verdant natural realm, you know, that's un, un, uncared for. And, and somehow I feel like you, you actually created a thicket of buildings, you know, with, with the, the kind of lower level all connected as a kind of root system. And then this, this growing kind of almost impenetrable thicket, I think it was quite intriguing. Um, I also like the connection. Um, it's funny when I saw this at first, I, I thought you were making a connection to the gridded burial plots as a reference. And, and at first I didn't, I didn't see the, there's something kind of weird about the containers and then the, the coffins, you know, the kind of stack of coffins. I don't know, maybe it's just my morbidity being COVID-19, but, but I think that, that to me is interesting. Um, I'm not quite sure about the filling of the site, frankly. I, I'm not sure, like, like you talk about the boundary wall enclosing and protecting and uh, creating the separation from the, from the um, container yard. And yet by lifting the site up, you're actually exposing yourself more. So they kind of contradict each other. I'm not sure you, I'm not sure you really needed the fill. Um, I'd have to kind of dig into the project a little bit more um, there. Um, in terms of the, um, these are always challenging. There's just like so many things to talk about in, in these integrative, and that's a great thing about your project too. There's an, you know endless number of, of ideas. Um, I, I really like the basic sectional, like conceptual. Even if you look at this sketch here, this idea of um, kind of go back. I'm sorry. Go back to that site plan again. Yeah, there, there. See there, like this drawing, even of. Uh, like it works with the trees too, but the kind of the, the connectivity of the ground plane and, and this notion of the ground plane as being this like connective uh, condition. And then the, the individuality, like you have it here, right? And that's kind of verticality. And the same thing here in this little drawing. That sectional, I think, condition is really intriguing where you have that kind of communal experience on the lower levels. And then as you rise up, you begin to become containerized like separated in a way, the individual units. Um, and without spending a lot of time talking about it, I love that unit, the donut shaped space with the, with the bathroom in the middle. That's like a really beautifully resolved unit. Um, actually just go quickly to one of your perspective views that show the frame with the boxes. Uh, yeah, I'm not, I don't know, I'm not sure about I'm not sure about the, I think maybe this is where Daniel was going with like working with the thickness of the wall a little more, like maybe, maybe not, maybe I'm mis misunderstanding his comment. I'm not sure about the frame panelization language. Like, like what's wonderful about the containers is they're kind of like a unistructure, right? The skin and the structure are one, you read them individually and they kind of stack. Um, and then you want, and then, and then these things are kind of, there's beginning to be like ground plane walls that are emerging, you know, like the foundational underground foundation condition, I guess just like an, an, an effort of like stripping the language down and working with light and surfaces and, and this very restrained language where there's like very little openings. I kind of want to like, just like kind of get rid of the sticks. Like I, I don't really want to see the frame um, the reality is that the tecton, the construction won't be solid. You'll, you'll have frames, but the question is, as an architect, do you want to conceal the structure, or express the structure? I mean, I feel like a lot of what you're doing is like, is about concealment and, um, having like the, the mo the kind of moments of experience are like very intimate and very, very compressed. And it's somewhat contradictory to me to then like have these moments at the bottom where the steel, this is what it's made of, you know, the steel kind of on legs. So I don't know, I just, I might need to just kind of think about that a little bit more. Um, that's just, you know, one, and, and I think that would be like a small move, like particularly, you can see it here. So like a little bit, like where, where the box is like very kind of opaque and it's, it's kind of obscuring what it is. And then, and then down here, like underneath, you know, you get this like frame and a little bit of sticks. Mm -hmm. I, I guess I feel like this in the spirit of the project, maybe to lose the frame entirely, maybe, um, and just work with the site walls and that sort of thing. Um, 
The uh, can you go flip to your details? Yeah, yeah, there, back up. Yeah, there, this, this, um, all of this stuff. Feels like you could have, like, it, it, I think it would have worked, would have been a little stronger to, like, lose the express structure and just kind of, like, work with the walls. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention before I shut up, can you keep going a little bit? Um, He's telling me to stop. <laughs> The elevations are beautiful, by the way. Here, go flip back to the elevations for a second. Like, keep going, next one. Yeah, like these, like there's something very powerful and kind of like, like I love the kind of mystery, it's like the mystery of the thicket, you know? It's like as a bush you wanna like, there are some pathways and it's like, do I go through that pathway? Um, like little slits and that's sort of like reinforced by the fact that they only have the openings on those insides. And that's that somehow that express frame the express frame is about like, uh, kind of like, you know, like Sancho Pompidou, like this is what the building's made of and this is how we put it together. And here's all the behind the scenes bits and pieces. And it undercuts this notion of like, of like concealment and, and not knowing what's inside something. And I mean, I think as an architect, you can take a couple of approaches of like, you present something, a building, like buildings fall into two categories for me. One. Is like you know what it's like on the inside when you look at it from the outside and the other buildings that personally i find myself more attracted to are the ones that are like from the outside inside is like quite a different experience in the inside that they kind of hold a certain mystery and there's a certain amount of unknown there and and the express frame is in the family of like of like teaching people about architecture and this is how it's put together and it is what it is uh, it's a different kind of philosophical kind of position um i think there um, am I Zoom shouting? <laughs> no, you're fine. Okay. All right, one more thing I'm going to say, and then I'll shut up. The details. Uh, keep going. Okay. Um, keep going. Oh, yeah, again, again, I love that plan. Took a screenshot of it. Um, these are a little bit like... Do you, do you all study like thermal bridging and the issue there with like, yeah. And that's the other thing with expressing the structure, especially like in a humid climate, like it's, it's gonna start rusting and you've got like heat transfer through the steel. So, so the concealment thing is actually like, like quite practical. Like it's quite difficult actually to express structure, truly express structure. You always end up with these awkward moments where the steel the steel that's holding the building up penetrates into the thermal envelope and it starts to rust and you just have like caulking around that joint. So actually like concealment is, is like, is like a, a kind of conceptual position philosophically, but it's also like very practical too. Like it's, if you can get your mind around, like it, when I was early in my career, I wanted to kind of like show everything. I loved, you know, like the structure. I wanted to show the structure. But then you realize how difficult that is. Like concealment in architecture is like a fundamental challenge in detailing. Um, so in terms of the thermal bridging, the last thing I'm gonna say is like, um, and I actually will shoot you kind of interesting detail uh, that is quite, quite uh, interesting how this was resolved. But I like the simplicity in the way um, you're kind of presenting this sort of very minimal kind of stone steel combination in terms of the finishing of things. I think that's quite, quite nice. It's just that this, um, you know, this this detail is actually like a lot harder to pull off. Like you can make it look like that, but there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes. And that's just like this plate kind of going from inside to out is kind of like, you kind of can do it like on a house once in a while, but, but like on a larger building, it's a real no-no from a detailing perspective. Like what happens is this steel, like say this, this, this trucker comes in and is air conditioning you know, his room and it's or her room and it's like 70 degrees. And then it hits that really moist, you know, hot, humid air outside and the steel's really cold and starts to sweat and drip. So you have to break it thermally. Um, and, and there's, a, there's a, you know, there are a lot of different ways to do it. You can achieve that looks like a simple steel plate, but actually, you know, so I'll leave it at that. But lovely project, really well done. And, a lot to talk about. Oh, yeah, thank you. Great advice. Mm -hmm.
So, uh, congratulations to your project. Uh, it, is, it seems to me very interesting. So, I have to tell the truth. Uh, first of all, I, I was a bit divided. Uh, Tend me to be uh, some prejudice because it seems uh, in the first look, in the first look it looks like a continuation of the container yard, and so it's uh, something that bothered me. Uh, it's uh, but it's aggressive in the same time. So. Uh, some, but considering this technique, uh, this way to to deal with the program, uh, some things I would like to uh, advise. Uh, first of all, I would like to to see the section. Uh, I would like to see again. Uh, can you come back to the section, please? Or building section. Yeah, uh, the building section. Uh, Yes, no, the other one. Um, no, a bit more. Those are yes. right section, I think. Side yes, section. this one. No, this. Mm -hmm. This. So I can see a, a tree uh, in the, in this, it's a kind of yard. Uh, uh, in the cemetery, uh, what what, what uh, it will be, what is is this space? I could understand. Uh, under, uh, I could understand this 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 section, this space. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think for us, the point of the grading was to really accentuate not only the promenade of approach, um, but also to get us that grading difference to be able to tuck our lower level in and have that um, be level with the um, port itself for access. And then um, in general, are you, uh, as far as the actual space, are you talking about the uh, terrace? I think it's the courtyard, Annie. The courtyard? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So for us, that was also the courtyard was this moment um, to accentuate that peaking light that we talked about, um, that we show in the chapel um, in the background, and to also um, continue our play with light. Um, but it, it was also a means of, uh, I think, something we took from our precedents uh, in the Mediterranean is using shading as much as possible, but having these vertical breaks between our horizontal plane. Um, so that's what's showing up there is one of those terraces um, with a tree inside of it. Mm -hmm. So, seems too tight to me. Uh, maybe you can uh, you can change the wall, uh, not this in this uh, 90 degrees to for, uh, for for 45 degrees to incline, uh, incline this wall. To provide more light mm -hmm. and release uh, the 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 whole building, the con the, the containers uh, to floating. Uh, so um, another thing that I would like to consider it's about the roof. Uh, maybe I I miss uh, if you uh, you can create you could create a kind of a bridge uh, and this bridge can be used by a view. Um, uh, how can I say? Uh, uh, a place that, that, that you can enjoy the view. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can uh, connect the, the boxes and give more set to the building. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I would like to uh, add the uh, uh, Murray uh, told an uh, interesting thing. I noted that you have two kind of projects. The first one that I saw in the perspective 
it's a pro uh, it's a one project but see the project uh, with the, uh, the elevation since another project it's more minimalist more uh, mysterious uh, mm -hmm. than the, the the project that i saw in the perspective so maybe the way that you uh, i think you maybe you have uh, to uh, we study the openings and the color uh, of the, the perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But despite these things, uh, I would like to... Uh, it's my, my compliments about the project. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank That's you. Very nice. mm -hmm. Um, we, we need to think about moving on to the second one in the next few minutes, so maybe I'll ask for any, any last comments. Uh, uh, well, I'll speak for the light frame intervention on the other side. Um, I, I get what Murray's saying about, and I think that's, that's totally valid, and I think that is interesting to get, build a, you know, the concealment um, and the containment of the structure you know where you don't give away what's going on inside it, but it was funny when i saw this the first time there were almost these frames that these pods they were either sitting on top of other pods or they were on top of a frame and sometimes they were two separated uh, and it made me think not of the containers but of all the refinery construction that i was used to seeing growing up down in that area <clears throat> and they would build these scaffolds and then they would have all these things happening on them. It was almost like this uh, universal sort of framework that they would plug modules into, depending on what it was doing. It was a tank or a pipe or a generator or whatever. But that's my first reaction was to look at that framework as that because um, it was almost like used. But I, I, I think it felt somewhere in between. After I listened to Murray, I was thinking, yeah, it was, it was, it was somewhere in between the two. It's like. Um, you're either real clear about whether it's a frame that this thing sits on and you poke, you place different elements in. Um, it gets murky when you do it only sometimes. And I don't mean instead of stacking them up as a unit. I totally got that. It's just sort of how you portray it. I think that's something we all, we all um, sort of keep coming through our design and, and get it to be more clear. But I st I think it's I think it's totally valid to, and okay to prop things up sometimes um, with those. I think it's just the intention. But there there's so many things in this project that seems like they're very clear about. I think um, um, you did you guys did a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I, I the donut room the, the one that. Murray called the donut, whatever the box in the center. Yeah. I, when I looked at that, I thought you were giving away a little bit. You have, you come into that room and um, there's a long hallway around to get to the kitchen. And I thought both the kitchen and the bathroom were probably way too big for that space. I mean, they didn't need to be that big. You have a long right. countertop and you don't need a full kitchen for a house in a room. And you could have come into a room and then had that, you know, if they shorten the box from the entry side, you could have a little sitting room or something like that or what but you could just think, make, make more out of it let me just mention something about that because i think as if like i'm not a trucker but isn't the, are the truck stops all about the bathrooms <laughs> this is what i would do right that bathroom would be open to the sky mm -hmm. yes yeah, so, that so that the smallest unit the trucker's individual isolated cabin becomes a kind of a model of the entire cemetery yeah that's just an outdoor court up on the roof yeah, they always yeah. get the second floor i agree <laughs> that would be great there's one by john lautner who does it what does it like in... yeah it rains a lot in houston too so that could be you know you could just be a shower you just go in the bathroom and the whole time you're brushing your teeth you're just getting you know showered on <laughs> I, I that'd be great they probably would appreciate that i mean on that that's i mean one thing i find impressive about the project is that sometimes like in these big sprawling complicated studios the the individual units get kind of like and here's my unit the bathroom and stuff but 
that actually kind of related back to the overall kind of concept in an interesting way. So I just wanted to commend you for the resolution at that scale. Yeah, and it's totally it's totally valid to say I just want to have small apertures that are located just where I want them, you know, so they'll spread light or capture light at different times of the day or always have the light balanced, whatever the reason is. You, you don't, not every space, most spaces don't need a preponderance of glass in them. Mm -hmm. but that's sort of the default these days. But, um, yeah. um, so that was, and it, I think that's smart if you're going to have a bunch of spaces close to one another. Mm -hmm. I, I would forget about shade. if there's anything I would do if you all like I, I would like this summer like next do renderings of that uh shiny the shiny panelized two or three of those um showing the sky reflected in the wall and the bounce light into the room that are really immersive and evocative would could anchor your entire project then a lot of these other questions just kind of like go away about it the openings are in the right place and the massing. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a moment like that, which could be, you know, which which was convincing in the way you described it, but I really, really wanted to just, you know, either through kind of like rendering software or uh, physically modeling that. Mm -hmm. In that original photo with the puddle reflecting the sky, you know, that still, that still works too you know, to have reflection on the ground plane. You should have um, taken that, you should have taken that, rend that, that, yeah, take that and you just turn it sideways and you use that in your rendering in a montage, yeah. I'm serious. Yeah, not a terrible idea. <laughs> like collaging it or just some kind of like. Yeah, yeah. that's a great idea. Okay, Annie, Jenny, thank you. Yeah, thank thank you. you guys. We appreciate the advice. We're going to move on. Very uh, helpful. Catherine Dillon, are you here? I'm good. I'm just turning the fan. Hello. Sorry, I'm just missing the screen share button. Okay, there we go. Okay. Um, so I'm Catherine. Dylan. Thanks for coming, everybody. Um, okay, so the cemetery needs, as we've heard, are being interfered with. Um, the industry of the port is encroaching on what we sh believe should be a quiet and beautiful place. Therefore, we designed a building that would effectively become a wall around the cemetery, transforming it into a shared garden space to be enjoyed by chapel visitors, as well as hotel guests and port facility workers. Um, so the project is entitled Garden Boundary. Um, it creates a clear separation between the port conditions and the existing cemetery in order to create a peaceful environment that benefits both. So um, you've already seen a lot about the site, but we just wanted to include another page that shows sort of how crazy this site is. And, um, you know, that cemetery really is like an island condition that's being surrounded totally by this really chaotic and complicated um, situation that's interfering with it. Um, so these diagrams are like a basic series of ideas that um, how we sort of tried to enact our design intentions on the site. So starting with the really uh, kind of this open condition with just very light um, foliage around the edge, uh, instead shielding it with this like dense, solid, uh, massy building that acts as a wall all the way around the site, um, especially enclosing it on the west, north, and east sides, which are where the port's most active. And then um, transforming that interior space from just a cemetery into like a garden um, that's inhabitable and is a benefit to the building and to all of the different occupants, like the, the port workers and the cemetery visitors and the truckers in the hotel. And at the same time as we're converting that to still keep the cemetery a cemetery and uh, develop strategies that will 
help people to um, still be able to mourn those they've lost there and honor the honor the people that are buried in the cemetery. So this series of diagrams on the top of this page um, is a look at the solar conditions created by this courtyard building um, and the different ways that the experience might change as someone circulates the perimeter of the site. Um, and then the public spaces diagram on the bottom left, or I guess it might be right for you, um, that is looking at the different scales of courtyards that we've inserted into the building um, based on the different programs. And then the solid void, the, um, the darker volumes are more inward looking spaces. Um, so we thought of service spaces, um, bathrooms, the kitchen. Um, and then the voids are more social open circulation spaces and the green shading are points of contact between the cemetery and the um, building program. So that's where access would occur between those. And then um, it's sort of a point where the cemetery might sort of bleed into the building. This is about our um, kind of the our ideas of how the materials are actually configured to give this give our ideas form. So it starts with this um, this U shaped solid brick sleeve that runs around the perimeter, and you know we think of that as this very continuous and solid object. And then the program is housed within it. And um, in order to do that, we implemented this steel system that's super lightweight and more agile and it can fluctuate and change and adapt to the different programmatic demands which you know it's a super varied um, program within a very continuous volume of that u shape um, and so that can be much more flexible and then the wood um, and glass are like the infill that then create spaces within the the overall steel structure and the brick structure so here's our site plan. Um, you can see that access from the main um, boulevard happens there at the southwest corner um, and parking is aligned against that um, southern edge of the building and then access from the port occurs on the opposite side on the north. Um, and you can see again that the building kind of encloses the full uh, perimeter of the cemetery. Um, okay, so this is our act. So you can see that um, the building has been laid out. Uh, the three distinct programs are organized. So the chapel program is all situated on the um, western side there. And then to the north is the port administration and um, break rooms for port workers. And then on the eastern side um, in the ground level is more social hotel spaces. Um, and then all of the private hotel rooms are organized along the edges of, of the uh, top level of the north and east sides. So on the plan, I was kind of guide you through how you arrive within the spaces. Um, for the hotel, you'll start out in this. This is like the entry side. And you can see we tried to keep it much more open because um, it's a more Kind of social open access area and so you'll come up here and then enter into this internal courtyard of the building and then you can go into the overall volume of the hotel um the lower volume of the hotel we like catherine mentioned is more social and more open um generally on the west side is where the chapel users would enter and we kept this smaller and more private feeling and then there's also this uh, row of cypress that um is planted along that procession there to try to keep uh, that space feeling uh, more sacred and kind of also to help with wayfinding so you understand where you're going. Um, to get into the chapel, you come all the way up here into this entry courtyard, um, and then you'll actually go through, circulate through that brick volume for a little and then enter into the main sanctuary space, and then you'll exit out through a, a different courtyard, and then you can choose to go back on this circuit or go straight back to your car. Or you, there's also another internal courtyard um, if, if you wanna stop and kind of pause or meditate, reflect about like a service you attended there. Um, and then on the north, you access it from the port. Um, and there's a ramp up along this Northern wall um, 
when then you're into the volume of the building that way. Um, another thing on this plan really quickly is um, we wanted to, with each side of the building and with each each wall, each boundary, we wanted to address um, them differently because they touch very different zones. So for example, on the east and west there, these, um, these bars are not connected to the port. Um, and so we tried to make the, like the fenestration very minimal and just these little slits that give little bits of view and a little bit of light, but they, um, they're they more solid. Whereas on the interior, there's larger openings that um, have more of a connection between the volume and the cemetery. And then on the north, uh, the northern edge on the, because the port is connected to the port, it's a much more uh, porous uh, zone. So there's like a lot of porosity there. Um, so this is showing also kind of those two entries, you know, the, the more private one with the cypress along the procession and the on the eastern side, it's much more open and um, you get more of a wide view of the space. And sorry, can you go back real quick? Yeah. So just a quick thing um, about the cypress. Apparently those are a symbol of um, mourning. So that's another um, sort of detail that's supposed to help you find your way to the chapel. Um, and then on the right, you can see there's a more densely vegetated um, L zone around the edges of the um, north and east bars of the building. And uh, throughout that zone, there are some graves. And so the, there are clearings um, and also breaks in the um, seat wall that goes around to let you sort of have a more personal and private um, experience visiting the graves that are back there. Um, okay, so on the second level, this is where all of the hotel rooms and private patios for those rooms are located. Um, the angle of the hotel room opens up to the cemetery garden, so it directs one's view um, toward the cemetery courtyard space um, and also allows for privacy from the exterior walkway. And then there are a few shared larger patio spaces up there as well. So this render is showing um, looking out from the hotel room into a private garden and then also the connection to the larger courtyard space. Um, the hotel rooms are lofted. So the sleeping occurs um, on the loft, it's elevated, and then that is stacked above the services, the kitchen and the um, bathroom. And that allows for the living space in the room to be double height. And that is where the connection to the private um, patio happens. So this is a section through that Eastern wing of the building, the, uh, which is the hotel on the lower level and then also hotel rooms up above. And you can sort of see here that a uh, steel system um, that allows like a lot of different change there. So we can kind of manipulate the section in different ways. For example, um, there's like the, the kind of common level uh, that you walk along um, and that's also these larger courtyards on the second level. And then um, the, the garden patios for each room are sunk down just a little bit. And then the hotels are just elevated just a little bit. And so that kind of gives these spaces a little different zone that they occupy and make them feel a little uh, different as well. And it also creates this um, changing surface that you see in the spaces below. Like um, this is what, like where the truckers can go and get food and hang out and drink, which we, we have affectionately titled it the beer hall. Um, and you can see that here. So like you can really see that ceiling fluctuating and there's uh, where this, where the, where the floor is, um, overlap, there's a gap and that can be used to let a little bit of light into the space below as well. So this is a section um, through the chapel. You can see that the floor of the chapel going down toward the apse is sloped down um, and it leads you to um, a large skylight space there. Um, and then also you can see the courtyards and um, the offices and another office patio courtyard are situated on the other end there. 
And this is a view looking toward that skylight space in the chapel. Um, so this is a section um, looking toward the port bar of the building. So you can see the relationship between the chapel side and the hotel side and the garden in between those. And then the north elevation, um, these are the larger cutouts. Um, this is the most porous wall, like Dylan said, uh, connecting to the port and providing access for port workers. And you can see there are some planters that act as um, the guardrails to go up the ramp and then down that um, sort of breezeway hallway that we'll see in a second. So that's that space. It shows a really clear boundary condition um, between building and port. And so then finally, these are some of the ideas we've been trying to embed into the project at a smaller scale. Um, for example, one of the bigger ones is this large cavity in the, the, the masonry walls are actually three foot thick, um, but there's, we're embedding this cavity in that you can run services in. So you may have noticed earlier that in the section, those um, these roof and ceilings are very, uh, very, very thin because they're not, we're not running services up there that we're instead running them through this cavity. Um, which you can access through a door. Um, another thing is embedding into that uh, masonry, these planters that um, kind of give the upper level of the hotel a little bit more life and greenery. Um, so here you can see that like the access door that lets you um, service the building services and then gardens excuse me, the planters for the gardens. But I think that's all we have. That's it. So are those walls um, load-bearing masonry walls? Yeah. And then the con the floors are concrete slabs spanning from, or is it a concrete frame? Of, is it a concrete column and beam it's, frame? So the steel oh. beams um, are, so yeah, so they're tied into the brick wall um, and then there's no concrete. It's just um, wood flooring that spans the beams. Oh, oh, okay. That's a. That's just a. Yeah. Okay. So you just have decking on top of some steel beams. That's like all outdoor space there, right? Yeah, this is an. This is outdoor. On the uh, on the other side where there's in indoor, there's more of the. Yeah. More of the slightly built up detail. Yeah. But you you're still exposing that framework. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Where are you guys? What? Where are you? Like, are you in Austin or are you guys like? I'm in Virginia. Oh, Virginia, okay. I'm in Austin. In Austin, okay. Just curious. Okay. Honey, where are you? So... Is he here? Hi. Where, oh, where are you? Me. Yeah, I'm just curious. Like, are you in? Are you? In, I, I'm in São Paulo. In São Paulo, Paulo right. Brazil. Oh wow! Ah, uh, small city. Right. What what time of day is it there? Uh, seven o'clock tonight. Okay. Right. Cool. So, I, I was I, I was intrigued by that uh, entry to the sequence to the chapel. Uh, you know, I like that you guys had thought about some kind of choreography of how to get people in and out, and it was different and un maybe unexpected, um, certainly if you hadn't been there. So um, I looked on the, when I looked at the plan, it looked like that corridor that you go into is so narrow right there. How, is that, tell me what's going on there. Yeah, we sh should have mentioned that. That is, um, the idea for that space is that when you 
leave the entry courtyard, you actually turn into the brick cavity. Um, so you're sort of walking through the, the tunnel of bricks and it lets you out into the expanse of the chapel. Uh, how, how wide is it there? Um, I think it's three feet. Well, oh. it's, it's three feet. Yeah, almost three feet. It's, <laughs> it's um, narrow for sure. Yeah, yeah it's narrow. It's it pretty happens. tiny. Yeah, that's all I was going to say. That looked like um, you had to kind of uh, go into your spirit state, you know, <laughs> it's an option. Yeah. <laughs> I cruise through there. But I did like, I, I, I thought the path leading there was sort of narrow to feel comfortable. It seemed like maybe it's the scale and I, I don't understand the scale, but, um, but I think also signaling somehow that you're there and that that door is special from all the other doors could be helpful. I don't know if that needs to just be an open, a bigger opening on both sides where there's light coming in. Somehow you, I think it'd be good to signal it um, or they might miss it and go in the exit door. You know, you just have to uh, think about that. But I, I liked that, that idea. Um, so are the outer boundaries of the plan you're showing the actual property line? So this, there's just a, there's your new wall sitting on top of the old wall, sort of, and then there's right behind that wall out there with the planters in it. The wall that you sneak through to get to the chapel is, um, there's all the containers and the parking and things like that. There's no more hedgerow out there, right? Correct. Okay. So from that parking area, that was just to be perceived as a building, a big brick wall. Okay. Can you all flip to your site plan? Yeah. Or like if you're, if you're, okay, what do you have like an L1 plan that also shows the surrounding? Like, was that, was that the first floor plan you had? That was yeah, just, this is, this is. That's first floor plan. Okay. Yeah. And then, okay. So go, um, and then go, so, sorry, flip back to your site plan. Yeah, no, actually the perspective one is good. There, 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 that's good. Yeah, that's good. I have some questions about that too. So is this, is this, um, is this area, like, did you describe like this zone versus this? already i'm sorry if i missed that um just really briefly mention that the sort of the l there is um, more densely vegetated uh, um, with clearings through to graves that are placed there and then the right. uh, so and then the um the more square area is um just cemetery just grass Okay, and if you're coming to the cemetery for a funeral or visit a loved one, you're you're coming in here, right? You're going through there like that. On the actually on the left side, so on the west oh, is here. where you would enter through that narrow one. Yeah. Why wouldn't you go in here? In there. Uh -huh. I don't know. I'm just saying it's like an opening, right? You could yeah. go in there if you wanted to. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. And then yeah. from and then and then this side, uh, which is much more about the port. Um, and I'm just trying to understand the basics of the project. You can walk in here and actually wander through into this thing, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, you have you have to go through the the entry there in the corner because it this ramps is, this up. This is four feet. Yeah. This is four uh, feet lower. So you would ramp up and then you could go in. Got so it. You come in. You're outside. You're in your your kind of outdoor indoor outdoor breezeway thingy. Yeah. You wander along and then and then you can come through and then into this space, right? right. And then and then this line here, um, is that like a low wall or something, or just like a chain? Yeah. yeah. But so you could actually like walk up and step over this or something if you wanted to. Right. right. And and we might not have explained clearly, but there's there's little cutouts that actually correspond to each of the graves. Um, yeah, so so that you can yeah, it's like a it's like a seat height wall, but then there's lots of cutouts along it. 
Okay, so if I'm if I'm a visitor, uh, I can I can walk in here and I can wander through and down and through like that and through and out there like that. Right? Yeah, you could do that. Okay. It's like maybe uh, yeah, concrete at first to the to the project. I think it's very thoughtful and like. Uh, with a high precision in a way uh, uh, drafted, like with a lot of like very sensible details. For me, like I'm, I'm more coming from an urban, urban background, and and for me, like I, I see the it, uh, like this more as a typological project, or with, uh, directly resonates with uh, very archaic uh, uh, building types. And so it's like the geisha that I'm uh, establishing uh, atrium per se. That you decide that rooms becomes uh, cells, which are introverted, which are completely uh, encapsulated, don't have actually any communicative view. Even when you say you have a beer hall, you know, resembles a monastery, because a monastery began actually with producing beer. So what I want to say, like for, for me, is of course like uh, it's a. Uh, very much you build or reinterpretate uh, a classic typology of a, of a monastery. But a bit what you begin to develop with the Cyprus uh, pathway is a bit like the, the idea of the procession. And here the classical typology had the, the building part uh, of a cloister, uh, of, the, of the pathway or the arcade, mm -hmm. which was in a way like, like going around the uh, uh, the, 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 the atrium. So what before Charles was also mentioned, like the, the entrance exactly to the, to the cathedral, uh, not the cathedral, to the, uh, to the chapel, uh, that is a bit abrupt or like maybe the door is too, too narrow or like the, the, the first place is too, too small. And, and like when you, when you reflect like, or when you look to, to vary this, this very old medieval or like whatever, like this old ministries, then it's exactly this cloister takes over like a kind of transition zone between actually uh, uh, the, the, the scales of, of spaces. Uh, and uh, so, and then I think then also in the last discussion, we had this, uh, uh, this issue now, yeah, like we have really, we have, we have sun, we have a very strong uh, uh, climate. So like, um, I mean, like then, uh, how you deal then with the, how I actually process for actually such a hot climate or how I'm actually begin to, to be in that, uh, in that graveyard or, or so now. And yeah, that, that would be maybe like the only thing, like how could be shade or something like the idea of temperature could be part in a reflection of, uh, or just a further iteration of when you think this design further. In thinking the same in the detail now would be also if I interpretate your wall, the thickness, that it's also like the, the ambition to make something really something or shy. I mean, like you have a wall which is I mean, really, really thick. But when you look to the detail, you build it up as it would be cladded in front of a wall. When you look for something to the work of Zumtor, like he uses actually builds like variation, like really like full scale walls like 80 centimeter one meter like just bricks and which sounds at first like completely elitarian and naive or like just uh, rustic but then it's actually quite smart because you use this as a thermal storage then as well no? so you use this kind of low-tech performance again of a brick it comes then again like quite high-tech when, when when you use it in that way and maybe then it's also when you think when you put like now you put planters but not plants directly because like when you have plants they have roots you know? so they they would go into that now fragile kind of modern kind of detail of a wall but if it would be thick it wouldn't matter at all and but i'm too speculative you know but it's uh it's yeah i, I like the 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 kind of like level of detail like how you these these whole plants and so on is, is super elaborated uh, in uh, on on all levels as a project. So it's highly professional. Yeah. I, 
I, I was going to ask again about the trees here. Like there were some mature, the mature trees out here that they don't show up in the, in the plan. It, again, it's a discussion about shade. Um, but I don't, I don't know what you guys were. Uh, did you, like I asked the last group, did they take them out on purpose or was it just a part of the presentation? Um, Cause those were from the photographs that I saw from uh, Cisco, they were pretty large trees. Um, that I, I'm just, what was, were the, are those gone? All the existing trees are gone now. Um, I think any of the existing trees that could be kept would have been kept. It was, that's just a representation thing. We don't know exactly where those are on this plan. Yeah, we, we kind of just imagine this, I think, more as like retaining something close to the existing cemetery um, with, you know, like a little bit more uh, care for it. Um, I don't I don't think we either one of us has anything against those trees, but um, we probably should have kept them in our presentation. Yeah, it's um, just to admit to cutting down trees. It's like everyone's been locked in their apartments for the last six weeks and they're like, I just want to be in the sun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cut down the trees. <laughs> That's right. Shade is also the entry. I think you were talking about keeping this open so you could see in, but what happens is when you're in here and you look out, you know, you're looking at this parking lot, you know, and or the rest are the, you know, the 7 Eleven out here or something. I, I think this place, you've, this is such a great idea to to run the perimeter, you know, and and make this its own spot. I think that's really clever here, given its surroundings. And I think it's if you're going to have a procession along here, you, you could easily say, I'm going to come in here and I'm going to make it. This is going to be some sort of entryway, some sort of transitional space that takes up some space in here doesn't allow me to, to break the mood, you know, but I mean, it's like um, you're in there and it's this wonderful space. And then you look out this opening and you see the, the world you came from and you don't want to see that. You don't want to see cars parked in the lot because it takes you out of the place uh, that you've, you've fallen into when you're inside there and secluded. Um, but you could have things going on along. Oops, try to draw with this thing. Uh, this thing could be, you know, a uh, uh, more building that's just there for shade that's you know you walk along underneath the, and you turn around here it could be another row of cypress or something it's okay to have everybody come in here and then the chapel is just this journey because if this is truly a lovely space and you've created it the way you want to it doesn't matter how long the journey is you've driven from somewhere far away to get here anyway and so so from one central place then you're controlling i think um where people arrive and the arrival is special in its own way. And you know, when you arrive here, you can see across, maybe that's where you get the clue is, oh, I see, oops, it's right here. There's the place I go for the chapel I remember or whatever, or you can wander out here. And I think that might, that's an easy thing to do. Cause I think it's hard when you, you don't come, this isn't like a, a grocery store or something where you come all the time, you just come seldom. And if you saw this opening here, you wouldn't know whether to go in there or here, you know, unless you had written instructions or something. But I think that's that's easy. But I I do like those rooms upstairs and how they they close themselves to the back end and open themselves out. I like how everything orients out to the courtyard. Um, I like the way you've been brave about saying, well, we're just going to sort of rearrange the cemetery. Um, it doesn't seem like it's that populated now so you probably could move things around um and i guess it's cisco said that there's still room for a lot of more people so uh more people will occupy it over time you could even think about how that was going to happen you know but there's a lot of procession in this in this uh scheme that's nice i like the procession up from the the uh container yard the way you've got you guys have arranged that um, and the brick, Houston's a brick town, you know, there, there's a lot of clay down there and sand and, uh, that's a predominant material there. 
just like stone is or limestone is a predominant material here in Austin because of all the quarries are localized, you know. Hey, hey Mel, yeah. that's an interesting question because I was curious about that. Is it um, like a tan color clay or is it a red clay? Oh, in Houston? Yeah. I, you know, I don't know. It depends on where it's coming from, I think. It's probably all of those. Yeah. Right. I don't know a lot about those. Um, clay. I know it seems like, I know on Rice campus they use that uh, St. Joe brick, it's almost right. dictated. From, that from comes from Slide, Louisiana. Louisiana, but, right, okay. But it's all that, all those rivers are just dumping their silt out into the Gulf and it's running along the side. I don't, you know, it just, it just depends. I think those are subtle differences. You can move around in the same area, not too far and get a different color combination. But I'm not an expert at that. But do you see, like here, for instance, you know, the clay, you know, we get that algin brick, which is the kind of tan color. That's why you see a lot of tan brick here. Oh, yeah. Um, and then I'm just curious there, like, if, if, are there red brick? Like, maybe a question for you guys, like, what, um, I'm just curious about the material choice, like the red brick. Is it, like, oh. somewhat referential to the area or just thought it looked cool or what? Um, I don't think the color specifically is referential to the area. Um, but as far as the brick goes, I think that we chose it because we had this idea of the, the really consistent bar that was really solid, um, and those cavity walls and, um, yeah, I think that's kind of, oh, cool. Just curious. I mean, there's just a lot of it, so I was just wondering where that, like, yeah. was it concrete sometimes or CMU, or you're like, was it like always red brick? It's just a, it's a very specific choice. It actually reminds me of like more like Sigrid Lawrence or something, like Sigrid yep. Lawrence. You know, the where the doors brick and the walls are brick, and everything's like the benches are brick. Everything's brick. Yeah, that was another thing that we were interested in, like the how the brick walls could wrap around to make that U container um so it would be wall and floor and then back up to the other wall all right yeah okay. well and also um like one of the things we wanted from the beginning is for it to feel kind of like like this is a civil war cemetery you know there's really old graves there and we wanted our building to not feel like this new high-tech thing right. we wanted it to have this kind of yeah. old character which i feel i feel like red brick feels that way to us yeah yeah well i think that's i mean that's one of the successful kind of moves, I think, like as an architect, when you've got a very restrained, kind of minimal, minimally, formally minimal language um, that it's tempered by a material that has kind of like a rich texture and, and, and well, I mean, Khan is great at that too, right? Like the, um, you know, um, like in uh, Rochester, New York, the Unitarian Church, right? This is kind of very severe, but the brick somehow, the materiality of the brick kind of tempers that. Um, so I think that, I think that works really well. Um, I have like a couple of comments. Um, one, one just in general, like I, it's a, it's a wonderful project. I really just want to say that before I sort of jump into the things I think you should have done differently. <laughs> um, Thanks. And, uh, first, let me start with the basic, um, kind of overall kind of approach. Um, we've been working lately on, on a courtyard, uh, house. And um, it took us a long time to get to the point where it just like we settled on it being a square. You know, it was like rec rectangle and it was like different on every side. So it's, it's kind of interesting to see this project. Um, and I think there, there are a couple of things that I really like about what you're doing. In a couple of areas, I could see you're struggling and I totally know where you come from because it took us months of struggling with our courtyard house to kind of like get that resolution. Um, I mean, ours is a house, not a cemetery, or not a, not a larger building like this, but I think the fundamentals are still there. Um, the first thing is, like, I like the way you're creating um, different, um, like, I, I like, I really like this move, like this square um, inside uh, as, as a kind of like, to me, it's, it's like the anchoring um, element of the drawing. It's almost like you're, it's almost like a drawing of a square. You know, it's a low wall, it's a boundary, you can sit on it. Um, it's kind of has a fragility to it. It's like, you know, very cemetery. 
But I like it in this scheme because as you as you move out, things get a little more chaotic and complex and less less clear conceptually. So it's a really lovely move there. Um, I like that the uh, that you have um, these different like I like I like this a lot actually. Like I like this sort of this this kind of like clear territory and then this wilder one. And, and that it's not, you know, this is where the square kind of like, you start to break down and play with the square, I guess. Like, it's just an L, right? You're not like doing this, 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 this sort of like more verdant landscape thing all the way around. You've got like the funerary symbolic trees on one side, and then you've got the kind of more natural park-like thing. So I like this sort of play where it's a square of landscapes, but then it's made, uh, it's defined by a couple of different things, a couple of different approaches to the landscape. So that I think is like really kind of successful. The other thing too, I think there's like a lot of different ways of moving in and around the building. Um, personally, I'm partial to architecture that is more permeable, that offers you, doesn't force you in a certain certain way. Like I actually like that you know, you arrive and you don't know if to go in here or here, but you're going to go in one or the other, right? Like you might look around the corner. And so I think that, and also like the fact that it's kind of permeable, that you could wander all the way through this thing, come to the cemetery and then come out and not know where you are. It's like, oh my God, I'm in the shipping container yard. I think that's quite nice. Um, but generally speaking, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of kind of roots to it. I, I want to say I love the chapel. Maybe, maybe let's talk about that because I think it's, it speaks to, I think, one of the challenges of the courtyard. Um, actually, yeah, can you? The section oh, or the render? Well, the section's fine. Um, keep the render in mind. Yeah, th this rendering's beautiful. It's a great space. So go back to that. Um, the, the um, I, I guess the question is like, it, it's always difficult. Like, is this, is this square composed of four sides? Um, and uh, when you turn the corner, the corner of the square, like one strategy in the courtyard is to define the square as a single object. And then you're opening, I'm gonna draw it for you here. So here's a courtyard. And, and again, this is kind of what we've been struggling with. Like, where are you entering that? And that, and that it's important as an architect that you hold the corners uh, and you don't you don't break the corners, right? Sometimes what you're doing, it, like, it's not clear in your project. Like when I go back to the plan, actually, floor plan. There. Okay. Perfect. So sometimes you're entering, um, like where the where where the the at the corner where the two figures come together right like this is a perfect moment where i feel like it's confused um and i'm not sure like if i haven't looked at it enough to know if it's like confused in a good way or just not not clear yet you're you're entering you're entering here and between this thing and this thing But you're, and then here too, this is clearer down here. You see how you're defining, you're defining this as a wall, end wall. And, and this guy is a, is a separate element. And, and, the, and you're entering in the corners where the figure, the, the figure of the square isn't closing on itself. You're entering through that figure here you're entering in the same way right except that spatially um go back to your 3d drawing yeah there so so the chapel actually you see the way you've you've designed the chapel this is one this reads as one element here even though spatially the chapel is actually like this thing and under that so instead of like stopping and starting at the corner, here you're doing a corner that's interlocking, right? Like, 
it reads here is one thing, but spatially you go under and up. It's like a woven, weird woven corner. Here it's like they're separated. Here, down here they're separated. Here it's just a kind of like, I don't know if you just like gave up on the change. So, uh, so, é isso, é para você, tá? Beijo. E depois eu falo com você. Um, and that, that's, that's just like an observation. Like, I think it's like a train of thought there that I don't know if you struggle with those, how to turn the corners or not. What we ended up doing in our courtyard house, because we had this mishmash of different corners that turned and objects not touching, is we just basically decided that there was an element, it's actually the roof that connects everything together, but we just kept kept this language separate. So there's an element like this, an element like that, an element like this, so that each side is a separate, defined separately. And then you're you're able to move through, you're, you're moving, and, and, and the corner has so much power to it, right? Because the corner is where it becomes a figure. You know, the corner is what defines it, what begins to define it as a square. So to experience that is one thing, right? To experience moving through the corner, Versus the corner being autonomous and you're coming into, like, say, the center of it here, right? They're just different ways of approaching the fundamental geometry. And I love this starting with the square and the kind of purity of the square. And I feel like a lot of your the energy of your project comes from this the really studying the geometry in a very contemplative way. And then these decisions about how the geometry works, whether you turn the corner and it's a hard corner versus an open corner you experience. It's so important to kind of master those because they're the fundamental spatial components of your of the of the square courtyard composition. Um, the other thing that I think is kind of interesting, and I'm not sure what the solution where it is, but that you're kind of struggling with that is, you know, a punch versus a figure. So like like here, here it's defined, this is defined as a wall, right? Whereas out here these are these are not punches, right? And and I kind of maybe you already looked at it, but I kind of want to want to see like I'd love to see it. I love the elevations, by the way, but I kind of like to see those. These little headers are bugging me. I'm not sure if that was like those little guys, mm -hmm. you know? Where it's yeah, like, there was a ver there was a version without those as well. <laughs> um. Maybe it didn't work. Maybe if you'd done it that way, it'd be saying make a header over it. But you know, um, we did, we the reason we put them in and uh, why we decided to stick with them is because we like the idea that it's kind of a continuous uh, sleeve and it's not having this kind of uh, zigzag or like sawtooth. Yeah, um, but I I really understand what you're saying too. I don't know. They just seem kind of I don't know. They're kind of weak. Um, and and I think that like. Like if, if you take this sort of like um, gradation of like going from the drawing, which is the inner square to this more more porous top, crenellated top, then and this thing wants to be less of a, less rigid and, and let it be more of a kind of like, a possibly, I don't know. I just like, they kind of jumped out at me as jarring. Um, the last thing I wanted to say, can you go to one of your interior perspectives, interior to the hallway that's showing the steel decking and stuff? This guy, right? Um, or the other one? Yeah, yeah, there. Stop. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I think, yeah, this is good. I just wonder, I guess, I'm, I'm not quite convinced. Sometimes, like, in, you're looking at a project. I mean, like, I've only been looking at this 30 minutes, right? You've been looking at it for, you know, days and days and days. So sometimes things like little elements as a critic kind of jump out at you and they kind of stick with you that bug you and you're not sure why they bug you. Um, I might not actually know why it bugs me in, for another two hours, but uh, like this, this, um, like I'm just not sure, you see what I drew there? Yeah, yeah. Like that, that kind of weird, it just doesn't seem to kind of fit your project. Like the clarity and the kind of precision this is more like a rupture. This is more like about a rupture or a splice. It's it's um, a splinter. Like, and your your project has this like the square is a very um, kind of static. I think is the word maybe in a good way. Like a kind of static 
um, condition that this this language of kind of splicing and rupturing just seems to not really like I like the wood and the steel is fine. I just think I just wonder why like there, you know, the windows don't do it. The windows are like very rigid and very, the, the brick is very consistent. And then suddenly you get this weird kind of like, you know, I don't know. No, but, but it's a nice play actually, like that the, the small details go those a bit off. Like, well, it, this is like always like a tension between like how much you can have, can go off. The same when you see like the, the windows on the left side, they need three brick layers on the right too. And like, it's, it's always like this, and this gets, it, it adds a lot of complexity, uh, also fragility, which is, uh, it's, uh, it has its own uh, uh, beauty or poetic to that. Now that's, it's not slick. So it's in one, like it has this uh, monumentality or like when you look to this view in one's not like this kind of enormous kind of length, but then this other like little details, which in a way breaking it or add a completely different uh, scale to it. So that's uh, the suppleness of uh, uh, kind of having something fragile or not perfect. <laughs> it also is uh, something uh, very nice. No? And, and I think if you were going to do this, because I, I do like the level changes upstairs that you showed, but if you were going to do this and this was going to, I think all of, all these beams would have to come over at the lower level, you know, at the in that one plane that's following this line. And then mm -hmm. since this floor up here is elevated, there would be another set of, of uh, beams that were running on top of those this way to to push that floor up. Oh, my thing's not working. Um, oh, yeah, there I, can, I, I think we get oh, what you're saying. Though, yeah. yeah. So you'd have a beam coming across and then these other things would act like purlins or you'd stack it yeah. up somehow. Yeah. And then the, the other floor would be up here jacked up and then you, the light could come through that gap or something if you could uh -huh. make that work. But, um, but yeah, it's a little, um, it's not going to structurally work that way. But also, I get what Murray's saying about sometimes if, if it's if it doesn't work out, if you try to work it and it does, it's too too little and it's not working for the complication, then the simple thing can always work. You can still have it go up and down upstairs and do that thing. It's just the bottom ceiling is you're still you're still framing it up like that. You're just covering it up if it doesn't suit your needs at the end. Mm -hmm. I do like that court at the end where it's getting all the light inside and those thick walls. And I think the pro part of the problem with that stitched together, uh, I can't remember what you called it, Murray, but that little piece that went between the crenellation, all of a sudden that revealed the way you rendered it, that it was a very thin brick wall. And, and you're looking at these big thick walls rendered in other ways. And I think by contrast, um, you don't want to jump to a thin wall all of a sudden. You to make it all work, you need to keep it thick, and that would apply to anything you did, probably. But because then, then though that that room on the top, it becomes a mass, and then you read the entire that entire assembly as as thick, as opposed to something stuck on the side of a thinner wall. Yeah, and also. You know, where, where I talked about that hallway, I can tell y'all ran out of room there uh, on the hallway to get from the, the little entry corridor, which I thought was so nice and that way to get into the chapel and then come back through. If you find that there's not enough room and width, I think that site is big enough to where you could just expand that whole thing, whatever you need to make it work, because mm -hmm. it's, it's almost already like you're moving the bodies around anyway, you know. Um, those coffins and stuff. I, I don't know where the bodies actually are, but, um, and I don't know what the law says about that, but um, I think if you needed three more feet or four more feet to make that work in a gracious way, not that running them down a narrow, constricted, you know, heavy brick corridor is a bad thing. Uh, that could f feel very cleansing in a way and might pick up everyone's pace as they run down. But um, yeah, we made it, we might've made it too narrow, but we did want it to be 
kind of narrow. Uh, yeah, but I think you know it, compared to the door that's there, if that door yeah. is a three foot door, that corridor is about two feet wide. And then the exterior wall is about, you know, eight inches thick rather than the three foot thick thing. Um, uh -huh. it's like a single yeah. wide. So I'm just saying if you run out of room. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You can give yourself more room because you had a, th a 300 by 300 foot site. It's pretty big. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I think it's time for us to, to try and come to a close. I don't want to cut off the continued conversation, but uh, I also want to respect hey. that y'all have uh, other reviews. Yes. Uh, Giovanni, may hey. Consider, yes. May I consider something about this project? And, of course. Uh, of course. Yes. So uh, I would like to, to see the perspective, the isometric perspective. Uh, yes, this one. So I would like to consider in some things that my colleagues told. Uh, and uh, first of all, um, Maybe this this volume uh, is beautiful. Congratulations, both of you, about this work. Uh, it's uh, I love this work, but I would like to consider some things. Um, uh, you are uh, telling uh, about the shield, and I think this build seems uh, like a very strong shield because uh, the permeability uh, of the urban uh, the urban t tissue uh, is lost. Uh, I'm talking this kind of permeability, something, uh, some connection uh, to the, through the port. Um, I think if you, maybe you can, uh, decide to do something, uh, 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 the administrative building and stores and something like uh, like this, you can, uh, could be open to the port. And the hotel could be, uh, stay in this floor, the cemetery floor, and you can enter um up the the, the 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 administrative building is some connect disconnections between here and here you can create a, a building a particular building uh, detached to the uh, these two bars and create something more height to explore the visuals uh, to the port. Um, and uh, your section could be something like this. Have the administrative building here, the hotel here, the tower, and the cemetery building. And you have graves, of course, here. And you can take out this wall and create something, uh, a green wall, just this. I think it's uh, this kind uh, of, this kind of solution can resume um, some concepts that the my colleagues told uh, and can maybe uh, increase uh, some values to your project. Uh, I think uh, I miss some connections uh, with the port. Uh, some administrative things could be here and uh, sometimes here and here you can have the hotel and create something, uh, some roof. Despite that, it, it was a, it was a pleasure to, 
to to see this this work uh, congratulations i would like to uh, only to to do this uh, um, advisement thanks thanks Um, okay, well, I think, I think then we should, uh, we should end. I, I, I won't demand final comments because you've only seen two projects and it's so hard to, to, to make those with, with few projects. Um, but I do want to thank you all. These were for long crits and uh, Mel Murray, Daniel Giovanni, we really appreciate your time. Sure, it was fun. Thank you. Thank you, thank you guys. Nice project. Good luck, everybody. Have a great summer. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Cisco. Thank you, Cisco. Thank you. Both of you. Thank you, Giovanni. We appreciate it. Thanks, Mel. I'm going to try and stop YouTube if I can.